Okay, the Comedian Youth Sports Parks and Recreation is back at a recess. <laughs> Senator Saru. Thank you, thank you. Good afternoon. Thank Can you hear me now from in my I think office? This is, this, Can is you much, hear me? this is much better. Thank you. You, you may proceed. Okay, thank you. Um, so the question I was asking prior to um, the internet disruption was, uh, Ms. Toma, you said the last time you got equipment inventory or new equipment was in 2018. So is that safe to say that equipment was not purchased um, during the COVID pandemic for athletics? Well, Commissioner Barry Benjamin, can you ask, can you respond? Yes, thank you for the question, Senator, and your connection is much better. The um, So, yes, we did not purchase equipment due, uh, so far during the pandemic. We do have equipment to purchase, Senator, with our with our federal funds. And to your question, okay. I think I heard, I think I heard prior you asked about um, specific training in light of COVID. Um, yes, yeah, so yes, yeah, so we did have coaches that I'm um, sorry, the Department of Health did approve for specific skills training, and Ms. Toma can share with you what our coaches did during the COVID. Ms. Toma, did she get kicked off again? Okay. Good afternoon, Ms. Toma, program assistant, Saint Thomas. <laughs> permission to practice individually on their skills. So direct a calendar, make contact with a few coach with the coaches them to advise them that they had permission to have skill training. Okay, so we didn't have adequate skill training in the, in the district. I, I, I could attest to that. Now I'm asking about equipment because equipment inventory is not just nets, balls, rackets, anything. Equipment inventory is during training, um, ropes. We have Endless fields on St. Croix, and we have open spaces in the St. Thomas St. John district. Did we order like ropes? Did we order um, just things to do outdoor training so our athletes can be in prime condition when we resume um, when we resume athletic games? And I don't think that we did that. I don't think we really didn't do that. Now going on to um, scholarships for our top athletes in the training segment, did we have videographers that attended any of the trainings for the skills videos um, to see what their endurance is, that the physical training, was any of that done? I'm sorry, I was on mute. Are you referring to the bubble? No, no, the bubble happened once and never happened again. I'm referring to consistent well, well, that's, that's, that's loosely, Senator. Oh, we know. Hold on, we... Commissioner, hold a second. This is what I'm saying. If you identify in a particular high school and a particular junior high school, I don't want to omit the JV as well, and you say that these parents have signed their children up for the athletic program. Three minutes. And you can't put a schedule Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, they will be on UVI's golf course doing outdoor training. Um, Thursday, Friday, at the same time, you'll have them doing beach workouts. Did we come up with a training program or require our our um, our health coordinators or whoever to train our athletes while they are technically in and off season? And was equipment purchased like the sliders and the, the various things that you would holistically train an athlete for because our athletes are not in the proper condition? Was that done? So, okay, so now I'm understanding your question, Senator. And I think I answered your question before to indicate that we did not order specific equipment for sports so far. We do have the funding and we will order those equipment. I think order, and Commissioner Barry Benjamin, why was it? These children have been home so, from 2020. Why wasn't jump ropes ordered, resistance bands? Because we're talking about games, games, games. Preparation happens off the court. Why was that not done? Because the funding source is now available to do that. We will get them through. Uh, we will get them through, Senator, the available funds that were made. The resources was priority for safety. And those coaches are not all those coaches are not all volunteers to say that they're gonna go and um, practice with our students. Some of them are VIDE employees. And as you know, we have to use we have to, as you know, 
We do have unions that we have to work and abide with in light of COVID-19. So it's not as easy as you're saying. Commissioner, it doesn't boil down to a coach. Nothing stopped the department from hiring on contract, using any funding that you have to hire somebody to deal with the, the physical condition, a, a wellness coordinator, a trainer, that you can say, listen, we are in a pandemic era and we have hired um, so these five trainers to deal with our, at least insofar as their strength and conditioning is concerned. That is separate and apart from picking up a basketball coach and saying, hey, coach so-and-so, this is your team and these are your practice dates. Strength and condition is an integral part of playing ball. So what precluded the department from hiring a strength and conditioning coach to handle our athletes while they're in off season? Because Senator, the funding source does not allow for you to do that unless you Senator, apply to you use the funds to in that place. Commissioner, you just hired about six new top tier people in education. One of them could have been your strength and conditioning coach. You have enough strength and conditioning people that would have volunteered their time with time. our athletes. Now, moving on, let me go to the next one. Senator, I'm being commissioner. Time, I don't mean to sound adversarial today, but I am frustrated I really with this. don't want to either. Let me finish. I am frustrated with the state of athletics because you're not talking to somebody who didn't walk the walk. You're not speaking to a non-athlete. And there were so many things that we could have done outside of putting them on a court to keep our athletes in tip-top condition and develop a new generation of athletes. Right now, we should have had a, a generation of tennis players, golf players, swimmers. But let me move on a second the now. the same thing for other students, not just athletes. The same thing what applies for all students. Commissioner, has the funding been released to IAA? The funding Listen is scheduled to be released to IAA, on, I think, on Monday. No, Friday, everything no, in, Monday. Everything in process, everything in process. Okay. Um, what, where, so what does this power yeah. school date tracker have on? Is my time been called? I haven't yes. seen. You, yes, you, 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 may, you may wrap uh, up. Oh, I see, I can't hear it over here. Sorry, I, I apologize to me, uh, Senator Cario. Just one more thing. The, the, the tracking system, what does the tracking system entail for the athlete? What's in the tracking system? Senator, the tracking system is uh, for the department management of our students. It's, a, it's a, like an identifier that we use to better the the... I better be able to identify the students who are student athletes. So we're str not strengthening the program for the student, we're, we're strengthening the overall support of the, the system. Okay, so I, I just need some clarification, Santa Carrie Young, in that, so what is your data tracking system for the athlete? Like when a coach goes up, where do you see the, the um? because if these kids were, if these athletes were training now, you know what their vertical is, you know what their standing reach is. What data system has that information for the athlete now? We don't, that's why, that's why we're doing it. I, I don't, okay. I don't recall, I don't recall that ever existing. If you know of a time when it did, you could share, but I don't. Santa Karen, I don't need a smart responses today. If we're moving and education is a new day for education, I'm asking for a new day, and a new day is tracking our athletes in an appropriate fashion. Thank you for the time. You're welcome, Senator Saru, and I think your position has been heard, and the commissioner is taking note of what you're saying. Um, let's move right along, Commissioner. Hear me, Commissioner, Senator. Javon E. James, you're recognized for your seven minutes. Please recognize Senator James' microphone, please. One, two, one, two. Yes, good. Good afternoon to the people of the U.S. Virgin Islands. Thank you, Chairman Karyong, for chairing this important committee hearing today. And I know Commissioner Raquel Berry has a lot on her plate. So don't stress yourself out, but at the end of the day, we have a job to do, and each and every one of us are going to ask the important questions. But first off, I want to say welcome back to the children who are now participating in person. 
Um, unfortunately, I'm still waiting for my son to get approved. He took his test um, last week, Saturday. But I made some phone calls. But um, I look forward to seeing my son get back into school. But most importantly, um, I want to say my condolences to the family and friends of Mr. Gustav of WTGX. He was definitely an asset to the WTGX family. And of course, internally in the first branch of government, we have uh, Ms. Gustav as well, who is the brother of uh, Mr. Gustav. So my sincere condolences to the family and friends of Mr. Gustav. We're moving into the important discussion that we have here today. I want to reference an article and then I'm going to ask my question. I'm reading from an article from Spectrum News New York and it's dated January 26, 2022. And it referenced that President Joe Biden's transition team on Thursday called for a major shift in the nation's COVID-19 response strategy to one that recognizes the virus as a normal, a new normal for society, an idea that the president pushed back on Friday, promising more improvements to the state of the pandemic. But long story short, as we know, we have to live with COVID-19. It is a new normal if you don't get it by now. Uh, March 13, 2022 will make two years since we are under a state of emergency declared by Governor Albert Bryan Jr. And my question to Commissioner Houston Kanasiong is, as we know that President Biden, who is a leader of the United States of, the, of America, who we answer to to a certain extent, what position are we going to take to prepare ourselves to make sure that we fall in line with the advice that President Biden and his team uh, is giving to the Biden and Harris administration? Because this is a new normal. So what are we doing to make sure that this is a new normal in the U.S. Virgin Islands when it comes to the Department of Education, Department of Health? Well, what we can do is what we've been doing before is been being very flexible, keeping up with the science, keeping up with the, the data that has been prevent, presented to us, not just here within the Department of Health, but also um, um, what, what's coming up from CDC and um, the FDA. So we know for sure that the pandemic is going to shift into an endemic um, level. And um, Dr. S and I actually spoke about this this morning. And so we know this is where we want to go. We want to make sure that everyone knows that it's critical for, for, for us to look at COVID-19 as something that's going to be here with us. That's a given. How it is here with us depends on the number of variants that come after um, Omicron and how the variant variants uh, present themselves. That's that's something we don't know about. We're hoping that they continue to decrease in severity and decrease in level of transmission. If that continues, then of course we are going to shift into the proportion of, end, uh, uh, of being in, in an endemic environment versus a pandemic environment. So we're working with that. What we're doing right Three now, minutes. what we'll continue to do is educate, um, ensure that the guidances are out there and uh, that we support, we do the testing as well as, as much as we can. We separate what we can and we protect. And of course, having to work closely with our hospitals, which we do, that every time we have a surge, hospitals are protected, our preventative measures in the Department of Health is there, our first responders and EMS are protected. Those are the things that we would do. Another thing that we're doing is a vaccination, vaccination, vaccination. Being in an endemic society or endemic situation means that we have to be prepared, just like the flu, every year there's going to be a vaccine available. We're going to make sure that we promote the vaccine for the COVID vaccine today and tomorrow. Dr. Ellis, anything you have to add to that? I have, no, can, go, go ahead, go ahead. Thank you. I want to hear from the experts, so my, my apologies. You don't consider me an expert, sir? <laughs> and just <eat> it. <laughs> we're all experts at this point um, but exactly what commissioner and said i just want to stress that um 
you know, this, this virus is eventually going to be considered endemic. It is closely on track. It is not yet classified as endemic, but um, really so many people have been infected so quickly that in the future, everyone left has some sort of immunity. And that means that uh, the co coronavirus is eventually less deadly. But some of our strategies, just as Commissioner Inconacian said, are to increase the number of people who are up to date on their COVID vaccinations, including the booster, especially those that are high risk for severe outcomes, strong messaging about the importance of effective mask wearing, um, especially now, we, we, although we're on the other side of our uh, Omicron outbreak, where we are seeing less cases per day, we do still One have minute. a very high case count, and we are watching that closely. So it's still very important to wear your mask if you're around others that are outside of your home. Targeting prevention strategies to the most vulnerable persons, such as um, such as access to antivirals and monoclonal antibody treatment, and availability of testing, which we really have excelled at at the Department of Health and also conducting outbreak investigations as needed. We are continuing to do contact seconds. tracing in schools to keep schools open safely. Thank you. Now, if anyone knows me, I don't deal with flattery, but I must say the Department of Health, under the guidance of Commissioner Hussein Kanasiang, they are doing a great job. And if, when it comes to the Thank pandemic, you. specifically to the pandemic, and if anyone wants to say anything differently, ask them what experience they have, because it's the first time that most of us, time. every one of us has experienced something of this nature. My time was, was called, but um, with your indulgence, Mr. Chair, I just want to relay that same you may, you may question mm -hmm. to Commissioner Raquel Berry. Commissioner Raquel Berry, I asked uh, the question regarding the new normal what would you say would be the new normal based on the guidance that you receive from the Department of Health and the strategies that you have in place to make sure that we prepare for this new normal that President Biden and his team are talking about? Thank you, Senator. Yes, our new normal is um, just what we are experiencing now, a higher level um, cleaning, a higher level of awareness in educating our children around health in educating our employees around health and safety protocols, investing heavily in the resources to keep our spaces clean, as well as our facilities, such as our air filtration systems, among other cleaning mechanisms from training for staff, students, et cetera. Um, a lot of awareness around health education um, will be our new norms in short, Senator. In closing, I just want to say that I'm happy to know, and everything is not going to be perfect, but I'm happy to know that the Department of Education and the Department of Health, that they are trying their very best. And of course, we, we still have some areas that we have to work on, and that is where we're going to throw our constructive criticism towards you, but it's not personal. But I will tell you this much, most of the time, my children wake up a little borderline to when they need to go to school. But they woke up 6 o'clock a.m. this morning because they were happy to go to school this morning. And I'm just happy to know that most of our children are in school. And, I, and hopefully, I, didn't, I never touch on sports because I was more focused on the new normalcy. And once we have the new normalcy, of course, it's going to trickle down to sports. So without abusing my time, thank you, uh, Commissioner uh, in Kanosiyong. And thank you, Commissioner Rakaberry and Chairman Karyong for having this important meeting today. Thank you. You're welcome, Senator James, and thank you for your line of, of questioning. Now that I think all my colleagues have exhausted their questions, I will proceed and ask a few of mine. Uh, Madam Clerk. Thank you. Uh, do we have, is Ms. Hodge back on the line from IA? If she's not, is there any other representatives from IA District of St. Thomas? Ms. Richman or Ms. Tatman? I guess they're not. I thought Ms. Richman was on. Okay, then we'll move on while one of them we get in contact with someone from IA District of St. Thomas to reconnect. Uh, Commissioner. Barry Benjamin, 
I realize in your testimony today, you provided an update on some of the programs that were previously mentioned in the June 11, 2021 hearing. Can you give us some information on the Coast Certification Program Part 2, which is a CCP2? Uh, the status of that program in June was at a planning stage and partial of partial kosher trainers identify uh, where we are today with that. Thank you for the question, Senator. Ms. Toma? Okay, I'm not sure if Ms. Toma um, got kicked off again, um, but this is um, actually one of the uh, programs that would have to be updated by either Mr. Callender, who's out on medical emergency, as well as Ms. Toma. Senator, it looks like she got knocked off and will be. Okay, well, I guess. Mr. Tomah, are you there? Okay, let's let's move on. Uh, well, can you hear me? Oh, okay, she's on. Yes, we could hear you. Okay, what was the? Qu can you repeat the question? Because it's going in and out. Uh, the status on the CCP two program. I know on June eleventh. Uh, we were at planning stage and partial coach trainers identify. What is the status today? Okay. Bernal and Tuma program assistant at this time, Director Callender, he has the final, the final ending of everything with it in place. He already picked the coaches that's going to do the one-on-one -on -one training with the different coaches that needs the extra the extra help in the training. So Dr. Director Callender will be the one to give the So you don't you don't have any information and status of that at this moment. Okay. Moving right along. Um, the student at the oh, roadmap to college. It appeared that it uh, you encounter some challenges there. Um, as it was in the final stages in last June, and it's not completed. Is it completed? What's what's the status? Where we are, and what were the obstacles that you faced? Senator, I indicated in the testimony that it's scheduled to be released on February um, 14th. We're we we had some additional stakeholders that needed to vet that um, roadmap, and I pref I refused to let it be released without going through those important stakeholders. So it's it's near completion and it will be released actually on the February 14th or before. Okay. Well, I appreciate the fact that you um, acknowledge that some other stakeholders were necessary to be at the table, so I could always appreciate that. So we're looking forward to hear uh, its completion on February 14th. Uh, with regards now to the sport equipment inventory management system, um, have you already conducted training for that new software? I know the question was no, asked. No, Senator, that's going through the process. That, okay. that, that will uh, come after. Okay. And um, my specific question is, did you purchase or plan to purchase new sports equipment through COET funds? Yes, Three Senator. Minutes. That's exactly, yes. Ms. Toma did update that earlier, and that's a yes. Okay. Okay. And in regards to the students... Um, as game official programs. I, I really like that and uh, the opportunity to get them involved, even those that might not specifically be uh, in the game per se. Uh, it was, you know, sorry to hear, to learn the lack of interest by some of the students, but uh, let me ask you, Commissioner, what are the strategies that you utilize to market this program? And, um, and maybe we might be able to collaborate to try to assist you in expanding such. Well, thank you so much. And I, I know the, the biggest hindrance that we experience is the fact that our students are not in school. That, that, that has been our biggest hindrance with everything that we're doing. Um, seeing is believing for some and being, having the ability to see our students um, play sports and engage in sports is the number one way to recruit. And the Department of Education um, specifically developed that program because we do have um, students who aspire to be, you know, superstar athletes. But as you and I know, most don't make the cut. And even sometimes when they do, they suffer injuries that ruins uh, or puts an end to their career. So there, it's another way.
for those who may not want to be athletes but love the sporting industry to have careers off the court and those who may have been on the court to um, and maybe end their, their careers early to have another uh, career avenue within the sport, it's the sporting industry. That's really the purpose behind that mechanism. But once our students get back to school, then they would have the opportunities to see, feel, experience what it entails so that they can say, you know, this is something worth trying. And, and really, I, I know once our students return, we will have um, a number of students interested in that. They just didn't have an opportunity to live it. One minute. Okay, just following up on that. So then, other than the students being able to see, what 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 other how, how will you plan to market to really get them involved into that? Um, Senator, that's easy. We we communicate with our children every day. Um, and on the school level, well, now we maximize our emailing system, so we reach our students with all of our flyers, etc. But on the school level, that comes with, of course, um, orientations on the school level. Uh, discussion from seconds. peer to peer discussion with student athletes to those who might be interested or think they may not be interested. So then, um, from coaches doing recruitment, you know, there, there's so many different avenues to to get to our students. We just need to get them in our in our presence. Okay, so so I guess the lack of interest was because they weren't in person. I, I got got you. So we're hoping that 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 will change soon. Um, uh, Commissioner Justa Time. Encarnacion, let me ask you, um, have we seen any data or reports or are we collecting any data as it relates to the negative impact of isolation of our VI youth? I know you mentioned in your testimony, um, you know, some of the consequences that that could cost, but locally, um, are we collecting any data regards to that to know how is it affecting our children? Well, right now, our maternal and child health um, division is working on um, looking at obesity, which, of course, uh, as identified, can lead to chronic disease, chronic disease such as diabetes, as well as renal and cardiac issues. So they, we're working on collecting data from that perspective. Um, but from a psychological perspective, I'd like to have Dr. Nicole Cragwell Sims speak a little bit to that. We haven't collected data per se on COVID, but we continue to collect data on the signs of depression, um, as well as suicide, um, suicide ideation. So Dr. Sims, can you address that shortly? Absolutely, Commissioner. Good afternoon. Dr. Nicole Cragwell Sims, Assistant Commissioner, Department of Health. We have, like the commissioner has mentioned, we don't have any data necessarily that we've collected for a number of reasons that um, students will need to seek counsel. Lately with student athletes and being a former athlete as identified by Senator Saro, um, the emotional and psychological implications of not being able to perform have been heavy. Students have been utilizing the text-to-talk spaces. They've been calling on counsel. They've been speaking to coaches. They've been speaking to program um, program coaches and trainers and, and some of these other practitioners. And you hear it over and over because they're not only worried about what's happening today, but their future in terms of college. Who's paying for it? Is it going to be free? Am I going to be up to par? Am I collecting stats, et cetera? So we've been supporting as we always do from a psychological perspective, but definitely the need is there for those students to get back out and to have sports in their lives. Okay, I think data. And, and yeah. Senator Carabella. I, I think it's important to note that um, we always take information we get from you and uh, the mem other members of the legislature and take it back to Esther Ellis in terms of epidemiology and our data collection. I'm sure that's something that we can discuss more when we go back. Yeah, I think now that our children are coming back in person, it's a good way to start collecting some data from them and maybe provide some additional training. Let me ask uh, the Commissioner of an, an Education, what uh, you have in place to support and train the counselors so that they in turn then can identify and help our children as they return back to school with some of these issues that the uh, Commissioner of Health have mentioned. As consequence of being isolated for so long. Thank you, Senator. And we do have both superintendents on, online who can share that with you, Senator. And I would love to know how, how 
of so, both departments are collaborating to make Fred this Jürgen. happen. Good afternoon, Senator. Can you repeat the question, please? It was going in and out on my end. We're relating to addressing the psychological, emotional needs of children and the consequences of being isolated because of pandemic, what training and support is being given to the counselors in the schools, and what collaboration are you having with the Department of Health to equip the counselors so they could identify and provide the assistance these children need? So, Senator, what we have done, um, we've already provided training through our service providers to our counselors um, around social emotional wellness, as well as our teachers and staff. Um, the Department of Health, we've partnered with them. We have put on some workshops. I can't give you the exact name, but we have done some workshops in partnership with the Department of Health for our educators and our counselors. And we continue to partner with them. Um, social emotional wellness is a focus of the district, and we are ensuring that our students have what they need and our teachers and schools have the supports and resources in place. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, Commissioner Encarnacion, um, how do our 5 to 17-year-old vaccination rate compare to those in other states? We are still very low on our vaccination rates, one of the lowest, sad to say, whereas Puerto Rico right next door is one of the highest. So it's not, not looking good in terms of our vaccine rate um, because o Omicron has definitely overpowered um, Delta and overpowered us in, in, in a sense, thank God, we were able to keep up with our healthcare infrastructure. Um, but at the same time, I know that um, leading towards the endemic, um, reverse of the pandemic, going to the endemic um, situation, it, it, it is going to help us in some way because we have developed overall from a territory perspective, a level of immunity, which is not as strong as an immunity that you would get from a vaccine, but it's going to help us go towards endemic. So right now we're looking at 83, 84% from 65 and older. Um, I think it's 60% from 12 and over. Uh, we're look, I have the numbers right in front of me so that I can actually speak to them. Uh, so that's what we're looking at right now. So we are not doing as well as we would like to be. 12 and over, it's right now it's 60.69%. 18 and over, 63.15%. And 65 and over, 84.82%. And what's, what's the plan then in order to increase those rates and vaccination within that age range? Well, we are one of the, this, the, the jurisdictions that have kept our community vaccine centers up and running with the help of, of course, our contract workers Time. and um, VI National Guard, which we're, we're very proud of. Um, that collaborative experience, um, VITIMA is assisting, our, our hotline is still up and running. And of course, um, just having the ability to speak to the audience as we are doing today, providing the valid information that we need to provide, the effects that it has had on opening schools, maintaining schools um, in the open area, and allowing sports and fitness to, uh, to rise because we have more vaccinated individuals. Discussions like this will help. Having access, we have always had access to vaccination. And so we are one of the first jurisdictions that opened up to all of the age groups. And so we will continue to do things like that, think outside the box, um, provide incentives, uh, as well as the main thing is to teach and have the access to the vaccines available. Are you guys uh, planning on now that schools are open and children are in person to maybe share some kind of pamphlets for students to take to their parents? What kind of strategy are you working in, in that area with the Department of Education? Well, we haven't spoken about actually having pamphlets. We have, we have information about vaccines, taking them to the schools. That's not something that we have discussed, but it could easily be done. But we do provide pamphlets, especially through uh, our CBCs, as well as some um, sites throughout, like MCH has pamphlets and vaccines. Um, but what we're planning to do with um, with education, and we've had two meetings thus far, 
is the uh, vaccine initiatives, and we're going from school to school. There's two schools in St. Croix, and, and um, Commissioner um, Raquel Barry Benjamin could tell you who those schools are, and two schools in St. Thomas. We're going to begin in February, and our um, we're going to it's going to be mobile. So we'll go to the schools. We're inviting both parents and children to come together to be vaccinated. So that education has begun; it will continue, and we will show up and hopefully have an increased number of those that are going to be vaccinated. I'm glad to hear that, and I hope that you guys continue in sharing uh, the word so we could have more of our children um, protected and covered. Uh, now, what about on-spot testing um, for close, closer contact games? Um, is that something that uh, the Department of Education, along with your department, Commissioner, have had conversations? Could the department do any on-spot testing for close contact um, sports? Well, we do a couple of different things. You know, we have our pop-up sites still available, so um, we can go to them. They can come to us. Um, we also have trained uh, with several times. It's not just one training, but we have trained both um, the, the school nurses. We've trained the teachers on how um, they can better manage a test in site. Uh, I have to tell you that a lot of the administration helped us out this weekend, so they now are more familiar with how the testing process go, um, takes place. So that, that's all been done. It was done since last year. We'll continue to train this year, but not only that, We'll continue to have the test kits accessible to the educators as needed. And what about Commissioner Encarnacion of uh, uh, week, weekend testing? This weekend we tested all, uh, all day for Saturday, all day Sunday. So if needed, we, we don't normally test on, on Saturday and Sundays um, because, you know, our team also needs to be able to um, have some relief and get ready for Monday again, especially during surges. But we did test Saturday and Sunday, and if needed, we will continue to do that. I'm glad to hear you're always willing to continue to serve this community. Uh, Commissioner um, Barry Benjamin, she's still on with us. Does the department see any possibility for another combine in the bubble where students uh, could be isolated to play? Yes, Senator, I'm not sure if you could see me still. Yes, we do have, uh, we're working on a, another combined bub bubble possibly for March. That is the identified month at this time. Thank you. Okay, look forward to hearing more, especially on February 14, uh, as we continue to move forward. I know we are in some challenging times. I want to commend you and uh, the Department of Health uh, for doing all that you can to ensure that our children are uh, back in school. But we must continue to do what we can to ensure that, especially those that are in the area of sports, uh, our athletes uh, continue to receive the training that they need so they can be successful and, um, and we can um, continue to take them through the path so that they could be able to achieve and get scholarships that are available for them. Um, the Committee on Sports Park, oh, there's a point of inquiry. Senator James, you're recognized for your point of inquiry. Thank you, Senator, as you said, Chairman Carrion, for the point of inquiry. My line of questioning focus solely on the new normal. Because once we find out what is the new normal, anything regarding sports falls right in line. So I'm not going to go really deep into sports. But my question is, sports, education, school on a whole is basically based on contact once you're dealing with in-person. And I know earlier the commissioner uh, uh, mentioned that they would have constant wiping down of chairs, equipments, and what have you. But since we're on the topic of sports and youth, children of a younger age do not know better when it comes to being sanitary and um, safe when it comes to the protocol. So my question is, as far as manpower and resources to make sure that we have constant wiping down of equipments and what have you, what is the plan in place to make sure that when we, f we move forward with this new normal, we have the manpower and the resources necessary to address this issue specifically on the topic of sports, since we're, on, we're talking about sports. 
Thank you for the question, um, Senator. The, I think you hit the nail on the head. The, I'm sorry if I have a, a lot of background noise as well, I'm traveling. But the topic of resources and cleaning, it applies to all. All of our athletics, whether in school during PE or in competitions, require us to have the necessary safety resources to clean and maintain Commissioner Raquel Berry. Commissioner. Necessary because of what you just said. That's the only way we're going to maintain and have the bubbles and have the competitions if we have the safety resources. Once these funds have been depleted, we're, that's where we're talking about our new norm. The local government will be responsible for ensuring that we have the resources in abundance so that we cannot keep and maintain the level of health and cleanliness, Senator. Right now, we have the resources and the manpower, our custodians and contracted workers. And out of fairness, you have the woman power and manpower, right? I think that's... <laughs> yes, Senator. <laughs> All right, just want to make sure because, you know, women plays a very important role, but I'm being a little sarcastic there. But um, thank you for your answer in all seriousness. Thank you for all you, that you do. We can throw a million stones today, because, but at the end of the day, I know for sure I'm not an expert when it comes to Department of Health and this pandemic. So I'm relying on Department of Health to continue to guide the Department of Education as we move forward with this pandemic. Thank you, Chairman Carrillo. You're welcome, Senator James. Thank you, Senator. A point of information by Senator Saru. Senator Saru, you recognize? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you hear me? Yes, we could hear you. Okay, good. Because today's a spotty day for us. Um, I don't know if we've been tracking our athletes across the districts, but territorially, when you do the data between the agencies, we've had 72 athletes that have been in trouble. 72 athletes and i i think that we have um and, and this is why i'm so passionate today and this is no attack to the department of health because the department of health they have been doing a superb job with the pandemic there's no um commissioner we're, we're good today there's nothing uh and the department of health that i really have concerns about but i don't know if education is doing a correlation between the students that are being arrested or involved in homicides or, or have been shot. And those are our student athletes. And we have missed the mark in keeping them out of trouble during a pandemic. And my last point would be, so I want to put the data on the record. We have 72 students in that category. And then lastly, we have a Cameron Thomas that left CAHS, attended Carl Harrison High School and now is, an, is in Kennesaw State University on a full scholarship. Diara Parson left here in ninth grade, went to IMG Academy, and now attends Hiram College. Joanne Roberts left here, attended Robert Shoemaker High School, and now attends University of Houston in Texas. And we have a whole family, the Phillips family, that relocated all of their children to Okeechobee High School, and they're now starring and playing excellent high school ball. If jurisdictions with larger populations can do this, we can as well. If we could um, in no time put together a travel portal for Department of Tourism, we can do it with our athletes. And athletics is just not, and I want to separate physical education from athletics. Both require a lot of work, but if we, we focus on games a lot, but a strength and conditioning component that is, the game is just a showcase. The preparation happens behind the scenes. And there's nothing stopping us from um, teaming up with help and safe beach workouts using our outdoor fields with the money that we have to buy equipment to train our athletes. But losing 72 athletes to, to crime is unacceptable when we can make a difference. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for sharing that, Senator Saru. Senator Francis, you recognize point, point, point of inquiry. for your point of inquiry, Senator Francis. 
by the graph to win finish. Please recognize yeah. Senator Francis Mike. Media, please recognize Senator Francis Mike. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I wanted to go back to Commissioner Encarnacion, and I know that she mentioned that there is no real um, mental health um, data at this time, available at this time. Um, but in respect to her testimony, where she talked about the physiological, psychological, and emotional effects of the sedentary um, lifestyle, if there have been any discussion, or do you see the possibility of utilization of our behavioral health uh, vans in, um, in our schools as our students go back into the schools to help to support, again, some evaluation, support, counseling, therapy um, of our students? We're very, very much concerned about the antisocialness um, of, of them for the last several um, months and, and years, and they're now coming back, and they may be followed in school. Have there been any contemplation, discussion, in respect to utilization of the um, mobile substations and getting them into our schools to help to support that endeavor? Of, of course, um, Senator Francis. Uh, prior to that, let's go back to the data. Uh, so every everyone who has tested positive and, and in the contact tracing um, arena are also referred to counseling, and that's free based on grants that we've gotten through FEMA and Vitema. So that's that continues. So we can we can now begin to pull that data to provide you with more clarity as to what we're looking at. Uh, in the Department of, of Health, Division of, of Behavioral Health and Alcohol and Drug Dependency, we are, are through our legislation, we also require our staff to look at everyone coming into depression. We assess for depression, everyone that's seen, and so we can provide those numbers for you. Well, I can't provide them today, but those numbers can actually be provided. Um, Dr. Nicole Kragmas is on, on, on also on, on the line. So, Dr. Sims, can you speak a little bit more about the vans, how we can utilize them, and what plans we have for that in the future? Thank you, Commissioner. Dr. Nicole Craig Wilson, Assistant Commissioner, Department of Health. Um, Senator, I'm glad you brought up the vans. One of the initiatives that we actually spoke about was the fact that those vans have to reach everyone, and that includes young people, athletes or not. Um, they, too, would need that counseling. It's been two years since they've been in an environment with other people, and that alone requires some type of, of counseling and coping mechanism. So our plan does include um, strategically placing those vans. We still have to think about the stigma of even having a behavioral health van on campus, et cetera. But we will be working with the Department of Education and developing a plan that makes it acceptable to receive counseling, acceptable to talk about what's happening from an entering or re-entering school perspective, which will, of course, touch our athletes and our um, students of the arts along the way. So that is the plan, sir. Uh, thank you very much. And if I could just suggest that perhaps rather than singling out students, if every single student, one way, shape, or form, at some point could at least be processed, I, I think that just um, utilizing that mechanism might you know, uh, yield a better result rather yes. than singling out students. I agree, sir. And thank if you. I may add, I'm sorry. If I may no, ask, Senator, we, we're going to be working with the counselors because I don't want in any way, um, you know, the commissioner... <laughs> Um, and myself don't want in any way for it to seem as though we're coming in to provide what education isn't already providing. This is a partnership with their counselors that exist already. So we want to be able to augment and support where we can, and so we'll be planning accordingly. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Commissioner. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you, Senator Francis. So that means that we will be seeing those mobile vans in our schools. The vans are already accessible on all three of the islands. And so, yes, you will definitely be seeing them coming up. That's good. I'm glad, glad to hear that so that our children could receive the support that they need. Senator DeGraff, you're recognized for your point of inquiry. Yes, uh, th th thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I would like to know basically two, two things. One, um, I guess for Ms. Toma, what, what generation of equipment has been ordered or are going to be ordered for the student athletes. And basically, um, how do we reach out to the students? Have we had any meetings with the students and parents huh? to inform them and to hear yeah. their side of these issues? Those two questions would be. 
Ms. Toma, I guess. Good afternoon, Program Assistant, Bernal and Toma, St. Thomas, St. John. For the equipment that's ordered, Mr. Director Callender has a list of the, the equipment that he has placed to order, that he wants to order. And second, as a suggestion from the Division of Sports and Athletics, what they will do is they had a meeting at the time about extending for the vaccination, but now at the time what a suggestion that they'll do is reach out to the parents and the parents of the student athletes and, you know, we always have, this is what we want to do. We're going to listen to, like, their suggestions and see what we can have or and place a survey in place at the time. Okay, in, in conjunction with the Department of Health, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not to be solo, but also No, in everything wouldn't, it wouldn't be by itself. But if you're going to reach out to the parents, it will have a meeting. But everything first got to go to director calendar. And then as a suggestion is being made to director calendar, then he goes to the commissioner and then the commissioner will set up the um, the meetings. Okay. Okay. With the parents and the health. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the time, Mr. Chair. Okay. You're welcome, Senator. Um, let me exercise have you there. Uh, Ms. Tottenman, with regards to the Genix tournament that we had in 2021, um, I understand that there are still some coaches that have not been paid. Are you aware of that, or was a status on that, and why is that? Co Bernal and Toma program assistant, coaches for which sport? I'm not familiarized with no coaches that has not got paid. For the, G, the the tournament that happened for the coaches, they already got paid. The last person, everybody got paid before Senator, the end of the year. Senator, Senator Carrion. Yes, ma'am. Commissioner. Hi. If you, if you are, yes, thank you so much. If you're aware, our, our goal is to pay everyone and pay everyone on time, all of our vendors and support. If, if you are aware of someone that did not get paid, coach, or, Coach or otherwise, could you please inform the department so that we, the problem is solved? We will, because I just received message that uh, if you, you haven't been paid, so I, I will I will reach out then. Um, and point of information, Senator Point of information, you're recognized, Senator Zero. I just wanted to add to what you were saying that yes, um, the baseball co and softball coaches actually just received their check last pay period after waiting a year and a half for their payment. Um, I contacted. Um, Deputy Commissioner Mr. Kimo Smith and he assured me that they would be paid, but a coach within a year and a half of payment is unacceptable. So that what what um, Mr. Chair, what you're saying is correct. I hope we correct that uh, and that in the future they wouldn't have to wait that long, uh, Commissioner. Um, we're about to close, but Commissioner of Health, uh, Commissioner Encarnacion, will we be receiving and sharing out some free masks here in the territory? I know nationwide. We've been hearing that they are giving out free masks. What's the status here locally? We have a, a, a very good supply of, of masks within a territory. We just ordered masks for each department as well as the community through FEMA. So once they come back to us, we're going to make sure that the departments that we are going to be assigned and agencies that are going to be assigned have them, and so they can be dispersed more easily. Um, we can we can plan, and we have not spoken about this, but I'm um, going back to the mitigation team once in Harris, uh, Director Harris. Let's discuss how we would disperse masks throughout the community a little bit um, um, henceforth, okay? But it's not something we discuss, but it's something that um, we know that we are going to have to do. But we have available masks once you ask for it. Great. Well, I would like to hear, just as it's happening all across the nation, that we have distribution points where individuals who would want a N95 mask can be able to obtain a free one, uh, Commissioner. Um, wrapping up, I don't know if any of my colleagues have any pressing questions before we close this afternoon. Senator James. Thank you once again, uh, Commissioner. Commissioner, Chairman Carrillo. <laughs> Thank you for the time. Uh, my point of inquiry is to Commissioner Hussein Kanasiyong. I'm not sure if it's a rumor or if it's factual, but I, I heard where shipping those free masks to the U.S. Virgin Islands has been a challenge. Is that true? 
And if so, what can we do to rectify that problem? The whole we haven't heard any, any delay. We have not heard about any delay. Um, Dr. Harris, have you heard any delay in terms of the mass being shipped um, through FEMA? We, we just, we had two orders. One was ordered about maybe a week and a half ago, and the other, other order was sent in on Monday. So I've not heard about any delay, sir. So so, Commissioner Kanasiyan, before we reach out, Director Harris, before we, we get to you, I just want to clarify before he answers. I think the concern was with individuals saying that they only ship to um, residential address and not PO Box, if I'm not mistaken. And if so, you could just clarify and um, place that on the record. You're speaking about masks or you're speaking about the tests? The free masks, the free masks. Okay. I have to clarify that. I have to look to see exactly um, when you go into the, the federal um, portal and see whether or not it can go I, I, directly I, I, to P.O. Box I, or, I, and I, if there's anything that we can do to rectify it. But I'm not sure. I can't answer that question right now. One thing about me, I'm not afraid to say that I made a mistake. I just made a mistake. I'm, ta I'm talking about a free test, not the mass. I don't okay. know why I'm thinking about yeah. mass. I have my mass in my hand. I don't know. That's how come I guess I'm thinking about mass. But the free test. <laughs> okay. I'll have to look to see. I know that I've spoken to many people and they said that they had no problems and it's being sent to them. Um, but I have not heard of any delays. But I, I need to go on myself and see if it's a possibility of it going to PO boxes. But I haven't heard of any concerns. So thanks for bringing that to our attention. Director Harris, have you heard about that? No, no, Senator. Um, I know one call our office or, or inquire about uh, challenges with the shipping to their um, addresses in terms of testing. But I definitely look into that. And if you have any uh, uh, anyone calling your office, you could direct them to me on that. All right, no problem. I want to congratulate uh, Chairman Karyong for a very productive meeting today. And I won't abuse my time. Thank you for the point of inquiry. You're welcome. Uh, Senator Joseph. You are recognized for your point of inquiry. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. I do have one burning question, and it really relates to some of the psychological issues that our young people will face uh, just getting reacclimated to in-person learning. I know some of the questions may have been asked already. I wanted to know if uh, part of the partnership that is being formed and strengthened with the Department of Health and Education. Has the Department of Human Resources also been at the table to help strengthen uh, what we are going to do and look at as far as some of the emotional uh, and psychological challenges our young people will be having going back in the realm of in-person learning? Uh, yes, Senator, Commissioner Barry Benjamin, in short, yes, our human services, I think that's what you meant, our human services department is the, the part, one of our partners specifically for um, our support of families. So that's a yes. Okay, thank you so much. And I hope that relationship is being strengthened with all of these departments. I don't want us to have any young people falling through the cracks or their families falling through the cracks. So I trust you ladies, and I pray that we definitely would have a strong front to catch our young people should any of them be uh, experiencing some emotional issues just based on reacclimating to in-person learning. Thank you kindly, Mr. Chairman. And I too want to echo the sentiments of my colleague. You're doing a really productive work here today, and we were pressing on despite the challenges that we encountered early on with the technology uh, during this meeting. I'm very, very much so thankful for that. And kudos to you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Joseph. I want to also um, thank my colleagues. Uh, COVID is something that, like we've been hearing, it's not going anywhere. So we have to learn to manage through it. 
And um, I think uh, the Department of Health has been doing a pretty good job under the leadership of Commissioner Encarnacion and leading us and guiding us to this very challenging and difficult time. And I thank you for the support you're providing to all the various departments and to the Department of Education. I want to also thank uh, the Commissioner and, and also the Commissioner Encarnacion, Commissioner Raquel Benjamin, and uh, uh, the testifiers also from um, IAA for their time and their patience um, as we had our own challenges this morning uh, with our technical difficulties that we were facing. So I want to thank you for your testimony. I do look forward that um, we just have to continue to do more and, and do better for the people of the Virgin Islands. And I would like to hear in our next hearing some more accomplishments. And um, sometimes we hear a lot of planning. Planning, of course, is necessary. We can't get anything accomplished if we don't plan. But sometimes we have to move from the planning stage to implementation. Uh, we have to move from promises to really see things that are tangible and that, that are in place. So I, I look forward in our next hearing with the Department of Education in the area of athletics and sports to hear about some more of those accomplishments um, from the department and to hear some more of the good news of some of our students also obtaining some of those scholarships in the area of, in the area of athletic fields. So I want to thank each and every one of you uh, today for your time, for your patience, and for the work that you're doing. And we here at the legislature uh, and this committee looks forward to continue to work with you and support the work that you're doing. Uh, thank you so much. You may be excused now, Commissioner Encarnacion and Commissioner Raquel Benjamin. Uh, we will now proceed to block two this evening. Um, I'll give you, before you leave, just 30 seconds to close. Thank you very much. I was kind of hoping that you say that because I just got a text from uh, uh, Dr. Myers, who runs our MCH program. Um, we received a pediatric grant uh, for mental health access grant geared towards training pediatric providers, uh, with, which includes teachers and counselors. Um, and the total of the grant was 2, 2, 2,225,000. And so we will work along with that grant, MCH, and our educators and counselors to ensure that we reach the population that we have been speaking about within the last few hours, and that is our pediatrics, our school-age population. I just wanted to comment on something that um, that Senator Janelle Soro spoke of, and that is the the fact that we we work very closely with the cruise ship companies and um, and and CDC. But actually, to be honest with you, we were working with CDC to make sure that we had stricter guidelines and not to just open up our, our um, ports just like that to the cruise lines. So it was actually the reverse. Um, CDC works very closely with us. And we always have to remember that we have to balance our finance with our health. And I think that we've been very successful in doing that with the help of our leaders, with, uh, with help of Governor Bryan, Lieutenant Governor Roach, as we sit together on a, on a weekly basis to chat to discuss issues, and we'll continue to do so. We've, we've gained and garnered a wonderful relationship with the Department of Education, and we'll continue on that path as well and provide the safest measures that we can possibly provide to the younger member of our society, my favorite people, the pediatric population. So thank you so much, Senator Carrion, and I want to thank my team that came on with me today to provide information from me, for you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Raquel Benjamin. She might be off. Oh, there she is. Commissioner. Thank you, Senator Carrion. Um, I appreciate this offer to provide updates from the Department of Education and Sports and Athletics. In 30 seconds, I will make this very quick. Um, the Department of Education continues to work on behalf of all students. I know this is a update on student athletes, but keep in mind, we are responsible for all students. And sports is not the only way that students get to relieve especially during this pandemic. So while it may be easy for some to think that we could have, should have, would have, we're living it every day. We've partnered with the right persons and our staff is working hard to make sure that all students, student athletes and others, artists, poets, everyone else have what they need in this pandemic. Um, by the way, for the record, we did not wait a year and a half to pay our coaches. We may have had a few individuals who we did not pay um, on time. I just wanted to set that straight for the record. We have some awesome coaches and we were able to pay 
majority of them timely. Thank you so much. The Department of Education staff will continue to work and respond in this pandemic. I appreciate each and every one of you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. We appreciate you too, Senator Francis. <laughs> thank you all. And I want to also thanks, uh, say thank you again to the IA a team also that volunteer um, to provide for our young people. So thank you. We will now move into block two and we'll be getting an update from the DSPR about their ongoing projects, their accomplishments over the past year, and what it is to come with all things of sports, parks, and rec. Uh, we will also be getting a long overdue update on the issue that is of importance to all Virgin Islanders, but especially for the West Enders, which is the Paul E. Joseph Stadium. Here we hope to drill down on the delays in the progress and to ensure that this project will be completed properly and in timely manner. So we look forward to hearing from uh, the testifiers that will be in Block 2. Uh, Madam Clerk, can you read Block 2 for the record? Block 2, 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. The Committee on Youth Sports, Parks and Recreation will receive an update from the Virgin Islands Department of Sports, Parks and Recreation on projects and initiatives to include the status of the Paul E. Joseph Stadium construction project. Invited testifiers, Honorable Calvert White, Commissioner, Virgin Islands Department of Sports, Parks and Recreation. Honorable De Derek Gabriel, Commissioner, Virgin Islands Department of Public Works and John Wessel, owner of GEC LLC. Well, good afternoon once again to the people of Virgin Islands, those that are tuning in. This is a comedian youth sports park and recreation, and we are in block two of today's agenda. Uh, let's do a mic check uh, with the testifiers this afternoon. Mr. John Wessel. Good afternoon, Senator. Good afternoon. You're coming loud and clear. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, Commissioner Gabriel from Public Works. Good afternoon. Derek Gabriel representing the Department of Public Works. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Commissioner of Sports, Park and Rec. Good afternoon, Commissioner Calvert White, Department of Sports, Park and Recreation. Good afternoon, Commissioner, and with you, I think you have your team. Can they also um, do a mic check? Maybe you can call them out, Commissioner. All right, Assistant Commissioner Renee Hansen. She's just logging on. I'll go to Assistant Commissioner Vince Robert. Good afternoon, Vince Robert, Assistant Commissioner, St. Thomas St. John District. District Administrator, St. Croix District, Jamila Henry. Good afternoon. District Administrator, St. Thomas St. John District, Mr. Kirk Thomas. Good afternoon. Deputy Director, St. John, Mr. Elroy Hill. Human Resources Manager, Relina Pell. Good afternoon. Director of Business and Financial Management, Ms. Carol Peters. Hi, good afternoon. And I think Ms. Rene, Assistant Commissioner Rene Hansen, St. Croix District is now on. Good afternoon. Also on, uh, Senator, is our Disaster Recovery special Specialist, Mr. Arrow Abel. Good day. Good. Everybody sounded good and clear. Commissioner uh, Gabriel, uh, do you have anyone else from the leadership with you? I do. So I have my chief engineer. I'm on St. Croix, Ms. Tawana Albany Nicholas. Good afternoon. That's it for you, Commissioner? That is it. Good. 
Well, thank you all for joining us for Block 2. We're looking forward to having a very robust discussion this afternoon, and hearing the updates from the Department of the SPR, <coughs> and um, specifically also on the Polly Joseph, um, Polly Joseph Stadium. Um, let's go directly into the testimony, and let's start with um, Mr. Wessel. You may begin to proceed with your testimony, sir. Hey, good afternoon, Senator. Senator, um, one moment. I am pleased to accept your invitation to provide testimony specifically on GEC's role in the Paul Joseph Stadium construction project. I'm the manager of GEC LLC, the general contract for the reference project building as directed by the Virgin Islands government. After delays under previous administrations, work was progressing during the Bryan administration until September 4th, 2020, when FEMA issues stopped all work. The PEJ Stadium FEMA issues were the first time in FEMA history that a FEMA floodway and floodplain came into play for the U.S. Virgin Islands. All issues were resolved with the issuance of a no-rise certificate stating that the plans as approved will be will not cause significant cha significant changes to the floodway or floodplain elevations. Work resume on October 29th, 2021 and continues now. All permits have been received from DPNR. Work is underway to complete the 3000 plus cubic yard three foot thick mat foundation that ties together 400 plus concrete filled steel piles that will be the foundation for the stadium. Some of the pile work in progress is shown on the attached photo. The current contract completion date is March 18th, 2023. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Wessel, for your testimony. I should have started with uh, commissioner, so I do apologize, uh, commissioner uh, White. Commissioner Calvert White. Good day, Senator. I, I don't know if since Commissioner Gabriel's testimony is tied to Mr. Wessel, you might want him to go after Mr. Wessel. I, you, you can proceed. If that's okay with you. you. You can proceed, Commissioner. You want me to proceed? Yes, yes, sir. Okay, all right. <clears throat> Good day, Honorable Chairman Samuel Carrion, Chairman of the Committee on Youth Sports, Parks, and Recreation of the 34th Legislature of the Virgin Islands, United States. Honorable Senators, Central Staff, and listening and viewing audience. I am Calvert White, the Commissioner of the Department of Sports, Park and Recreation, here to provide testimony on the status of operations of the department to include, but not limited to, projects, initiatives, and the status of Polly Joseph Stadium project. I want first to introduce members of my leadership team, Ms. Renee Hansen, Assistant Commissioner St. Croix, Mr. Vincent Roberts, Assistant Commissioner St. Thomas St. John District, Ms. Carol Peters, Director of Business and Financial Management. Ms. Relina Pell, Human Resources Manager. <clears throat> Ms. Jamila Henry, District Administrator of Sports and Recreation, St. Croix District. Mr. Kirk Thomas, District Administrator of Sports and Recreation, St. Thomas, St. John District. And Mr. Elroy Hill, Deputy Director, St. John. Also here with me is Mr. Carol Abel, the Department's Disaster Recovery Specialist. The management of our disaster recovery projects has been no easy feat. The disaster recovery team at DSPR has been working tirelessly to keep our Federal Emergency Management Agency public assistance grant and hazard mitigation grant program funded projects moving to completion. Currently, we have a total of 51 projects territory-wide with a combined estimated project cost of about $30 million. At the, community, at the Committee on Disaster Recovery and Infrastructure Senate hearing on Wednesday, May 18, 2021, the department reported 10 projects completed, three projects either starting or nearing completion, 16 projects out for solicitation, 
and 14 projects in the architectural and engineering stage, with most of them having at least 50% of the a &E design completed. To date, the department now has 16 projects completed, 10 projects with contractors on site, one project will be completed in-house, four projects in the contracted phase, two projects that are being solicited for construction services, seven projects in the a &E phase, and three hazard mitigation projects. The list is as follows. Completed 16 projects. The main office in St. Croix was completed on July 2018, contract cost $64,750. The main office on St. Thomas was completed October 2018. Contract cost was $92,877 plus $20,038.80 in damaged furniture. The David Hamilton Jackson Park was completed October 2018. Contract cost $139,374.75. The Vincent Mason Coral Resort Mombiju Park debris removal was completed in-house September 2019. The Franklin Roosevelt Veterans Park was completed October 2020 of a contract cost of $38,435. Emancipation Garden Park was completed November 2020, contract cost $30,275. Fairchild Park was completed November 2020, contract cost $17,450. Omar, Park, Omar Brown Park was completed November 2020, contract cost $29,850. Smith Bay Tiny Touch Playground was completed November 2020, contract cost $18,900. The Romeo Malone Center was completed December 2020, contract cost $27,300. The Clock Tower Plaza was completed 2021, contract cost $25,000. The Emil Henderson Court was completed June 2021, contract cost $24,240. Educators Park was completed August 2021, contract cost $39,100. Winston Ramos Center was completed November 2021, contract cost $43,391. Valdemar Hill Lookout Point was completed November 2021, contract cost $45,489. The Milton Newton Park was completed December 2021, contract cost $14,080. The following projects uh, all have contractors on site with work going on as we speak. Campo Rico Basketball Court, the estimated completion date is February 2022, contract cost $44,120. Composite parks, which consist of about four to five different parks, which are Limpric Park, Princess Park, Glen Recreation Park, Castle Park Playground, La Valley Recreation Park, and Mombiju Park. Estimated completion date is February 2022. Contract cost $288,614.20. Kramer's Park Pavilion. Estimated completion is April 2022. Contract cost $781,357.14. Fort Frederick Beach, estimate, estimated completion, completion April 2022, with a contract cost of $236,774.37. Isaac Boyne's Bar Park, currently 90% of the work is completed. Estimated completion date is April 2022. Contract cost is $286,000. $416. Currently, we are waiting the LED lights to arrive on the island. Pedro Cruz Ballpark, ex estimated completion is May 2022. Contract cost $211,966.76. Joseph O'Bain Ballpark Facility and French Dunk Tiny Tot Playground, estimated completion is May 2022. Project cost is $439,545. Lionel Roberts Stadium, estimated completion is May 2022. Project cost $749,911.30. Vincent F. Mason Coral Resort Park and Pool, estimated completion is May 2022. Project, project cost $2,719,837.33. 
Border Park, which consists of four to five parks combined as one, which is Border Park, Su Susana Santana Beach Recreation Center, Christensted Beachfront, Vern Richards Veterans Park, and Williams Delight Community Center. Estimation completion is June 2022. Contract cost is $416,749.29. In addition to that project scope, Governor Albert Bryan Jr. Appro approved $1.5 million to complete the improvements to the Frederickstead waterfront spanning from Marley Beach through Strand Street to Boulder Park and included a new and upgraded playground in Major Cummings Park. Cookie Beach, which is being done in-house, this project has gone out for formal solicitation twice. Each time, the Bid Evaluation Committee recommended canceling the invitation for bid due to the excessive bid amounts. The plan is to complete this project in-house with our maintenance staff within the first half of this year. The following projects are in the contracting stage. Primus Park concession stand, contract cost, contract cost $1,544,755. The Department of Property and Procurement is drafting a construction contract. All bids received came in over both engineers' estimate and FEMA-obligated estimated project costs of $695,136. The Evaluation Committee recommended that DSPR selected the lowest of the four bids at $1,544,755. DSPR then requested that FEMA provided a cost alignment to support this contract. That project is currently going through the approval project. The Doris Hodge Tennis Center, Contract costs $167,355.80. DPP is currently drafting a construction contract. The Emil Griffith Ballpark contract costs $1,339,567. A construction contract is being drafted by DPP. The Rudy Craiger Complex contract costs $931,030. DPP is currently drafting the construction complex. The current projects are out for solicitation. These bids are now being advertised. Um, Alvin McBean Complex Park, bids, the bids are due for uh, on February 3rd, 2022. Uh, this is the third time that this project has been out for solicitation. And the current Terrace Bar Park, which also this is the third time an invitation for bid uh, has been gone out. We will be requesting to the Department of Property and Procurement this week and we anticipate seeing those advertisements in early February 2022. Excuse me. The current projects are in the A and E stages, architectural and engineering. The Cruise Bay Tennis Court and Orville Brown Basketball Courts. Uh, scoping is being developed by DSPR and DPW. This project will be combined, combined with the concession and bleachers of the Winston Wells project. The DC Canigata Complex, the design for this project is 100% completed. This, the, this project assistant project will be combined with two HMGP projects, the DC Canigator Generator Project and the DC Canigator Wind Retrofit Project to be solicited in, in February 2022. The center will be used as a shelter if, you, if needed after a disaster. Estate Profit Community Center, the conceptual design is completed. Ezra Fredericks Ballpark, DSPR is con currently exploring converting the space of this facility to a skate and bike park and creating a green space for play. Lionel Smut Richards Ball Park, a second IFB will be requested through the Department of Property and Procurement for the A&E of this project. We anticipate seeing those advertisements in February 2022. Reynold Jackson Complex, design for this project is 100% completed and will be reviewed by DPW. Solicitation for this project will go out February 2022. The St. John Community Center, the a &E portion of this project is supported as phase one of the HMGP project. The final scope would, will rebuild this facility using a combination of FEMA public assistance, HMGP, and Public Finance Authority capital improvement funding. The department has three hazard mitigation programs or projects under its roof. The HMGP or hazard mitigation grant program provides funding for eligible activities that reduce community vulnerability to disasters and their effects, promote community safety and resilience, and promote community vitality. These grants cover 100% of the project costs. 
Current, currently, DSPR has these three projects. The St. John Community Safe Room Building Retrofit. As I stated, the contract has been executed to complete phase one. Uh, with an estimated project cost of about 2.3 million. This facility would include three entrances and an elevator, be ADA compliant, harden, harden the building against hurricane force winds, have built-in guttering, hurricane resistant case wind windows, and entrances constructed out of aluminum. A 30K W generator, a 200 gallon fuel storage tank, and two systems for water storage will also be incorporated in the design. The SPR has an additional $450,000 in PFA capital improvement funding to add to the final project. The DC Canigata Recreational Center and Sports Complex Generator Project, the installation of a 60 kilowatt generator, 500 gallon fuel tank, automatic transfer switch, and related electronic connections, and installation of a wind rated Prefabricated metal enclosed are all included in the approved scope of work for this project. The DC Canigata Center and Sports Complex win retrofit. This HMGP project funding was increased to include a total roof replacement in addition to the hardening of the existing building's window opening, doorways, continuous load path, gutters and downspouts, and the exterior lighting. Currently, the, dep the department has one project uh, that is pending a FEMA decision, which is the Massac uh, Boxing Center building. The estimated project cost is $2,440,000. FEMA has unofficially deemed this project ineligible. However, we are committed to undergoing the lengthy appeal process. We have filed an appeal to the federal government and are currently presenting our case as to why this project should be awarded uh, funds. Currently, the department have two projects on hold, the Randall Dock James track and the Clinton Phipps race track. Although there is still litigation pending, the amended agreement between the GVI and VIGL has allowed the promoter to begin redevelopment at the Randall Dock James race track on St. Croix. Governor Bryant has been negotiating the terms of an agreement to resume renovations at the Clinton Phipps race track, which I hope this body would support the outcome of those negotiations. The department had several alternate projects. The Honeymoon Beach project was obligated to have an estimated project cost of $2,275,078. However, FEMA would not fund the project unless we agree to mitigation because of the proximity to the coastline. The department was given three options, elevate the structure, remove and relocate the construction or accept the fixed cost offer opting into a 428 public assistant alternate procedures for permanent work program, DSPR opted for the later. Section 428 of the Robert T. Stafford Disaster Relief of Emergency Assistant Act as amended, Stafford Act 1 authorizes FEMA to award public assistance funding based on the fixed estimates. Opting into the 428 PAP allows the department to administrate administer the funds in a way that will best meet the department needs for recovery, long-term resiliency, and future preparedness. Through this program, FEMA does not require us to rebuild the facilities back to their pre-storm condition. The purchase of, a, of equipment, res, restoring and disaster damage facilities, and hazard mitigation efforts are all eligible costs under the 428 PAP program. A detailed spending plan for the total aggregated amount was submitted and approved by FEMA. To date, the department has received two John Deere tractors and is currently awaiting the equipment attachments. We have also ordered two beach bob, two bob beach rakes and are eagerly awaiting their arrival to the territory. We have begun using the funding for the 428 alternate project to convert the lighting in our parks to a comprehensive LED lighting system. The remainder of the funds will be used to purchase new basketball rims and backboards at selected basketball courts. Attached is a detailed list of how that spending will be used. While we continue to move forward with our facilities restoration, DSPR has additional projects to enhance our facilities. When I, when I appeared before this body in 2021, 
I mentioned that DSPR was accepting bid proposal from contractors to resurface, repave, and restripe 20 basketball courts, 14 tennis courts, and eight paddleball courts throughout the territory under the authority of DSPR. Since that time, the department has executed a contract in each district. We are just as excited as the community that this project is currently on the way. The contractor has completed three basketball courts and two tennis courts and is now working at the Reynold Jackson facility in Estate Wim. Resurfacing at the Reynold Jackson should be completed by the end of this week. Uh, just got some pictures earlier that the basketball court is finished. They're currently now on the volleyball court. Funding for the resurfacing project comes from the FY 2020 Capital Improvement Project Grant awarded by the Department of Interior Office of Insul Insular Affairs. Below is a complete chart of all the facilities DSPR intends to refurbish. The Reynold Jackson com Recreation Complex, two volleyball courts, one basketball court. Rudy Craiger Recreational Complex, two tennis courts, two, battle ba two paddleball courts, one basketball court. DC Canagata Recreation Complex, three tennis courts, two paddleball courts, one basketball court. Isaac Boings, one tennis court, one basketball court. Emil Gravy Henderson Sports, Sports Court, one tennis court, one basketball court. Glen Recreation, Recreational Park, one basketball court. La Grande Princess Park, one basketball court. Mombiju Park, one basketball court. Campo Rico Playground Park, one basketball court. Castle Burke Basketball Court, one basketball court, Williams Delight Basketball Court, one basketball court, La Valley Recreational Park, one basketball court, Pedro Cruz Basketball Court, one basketball court, Alvin Mac on the island of St. Thomas, Alvin McBean Recreation Complex, one tennis court, two paddleball courts, and two basketball courts, Ezra Fredericks Ball Park, one basketball court. Lionel Smut Richards Ballpark and Basketball Court, one basketball court. The Rinston Waymo Center and Basketball Court, one basketball court. Doris Hodge Tennis Court in Subase, two tennis courts, two paddleball courts. Milt Newton Park, one basketball court. On the island of St. John, Orville Brown Basketball Court, Pine Peace, one basketball court. The Cruise Bay Tennis Court, two tennis courts. Again, the total is 14 tennis courts, eight paddleball courts, 20 basketball courts that the department will be resurfacing, repaving, revitalizing. Mm. Act number 8448, or bill number 34-0014, the 34th legislature approved $50,000 in the Tourism Revolving Fund to complete the site utilization plan at the Estate Nazareth Number 1 and 2 Red Hook. With the assistance of the Department of Property and Procurement, a contract has been awarded to Bushelter LLC to complete the utilization plan that will allow us to better understand what facilities can and should fit at the property. DSPR, DPP, the Virgin Islands Port Authority, and the Virgin Islands Cricket Association have had several meetings to discuss the land preparation needed to create a cricket pitch. DPP has issued a license agreement giving the VICA access to the property. The Virgin Islands Cricket Association intends to construct a pitch at the facility by June of this year, giving cricketers a place to play the sport they love. I applaud the Department of Public Works for their management of the Polly Joseph Stadium project. For me, seeing the concrete pour of the left and right dugout floor brought much excitement and ant anticipation for the next phase. The concrete pour for the right field and center field, field floor slabs. Commissioner Derek Gabriel and his team would provide you more details during his testimony at today's hearing. In 2020, the Caribbean Drag Racing Association received 500,000 in government funding to begin the work of building a better, safer track in addition to the private sector support, that funding covered the cost of paving the main drag racing strip and the construction of ADA compliant bleachers and a judge tower with a VIP section. Governor Albert Bryan Jr. signed Bill 34-0020 
now Act 8449, appropriating $475,000 to complete the drag racing strip. In October 2021, through a notice of grant award, DSPR released half of that appropriation, $337,000, $750, to complete the redevelopment of the drag racing site just east of the Henry E. Wilson Airport. The remaining $337,750 will be released to the CDRA according to the stipulations outlined in the Notice of Grant Award. After years of negotiation, on December 9, 2021, Governor Albert Bryan Jr. signed an agreement with the Renaissance Group Vice President of Engineering Energy, Jehangir Zachariah. The donation of 2.5-acre parcel of land by the Renaissance Group allows the CDRA to extend its strip and drag racing facility and enhance additional safety measures. The Brian Roach administration is grateful for the endowment to the government of the Virgin Islands. I will continue to work closely with the CDRA president, Mr. Arthur Hector, to ensure that the re-emergence of drag racing remains a priority. The CDRA is working closely with the Port Authority to secure liability insurance needed to resume the construction. The success of DSPR relies heavily on the relationships with our, that we have with our community. DSPR, <coughs> excuse me, DSPR continues to form great partnerships with the government agencies and private donors. In November 2021, DSPR partnered with Waste Management Authority to place trust receptacles in the Cruise Bay St. John area. This past December, the department had two successful cleanup days with nonprofit groups. The first was held at Emil Griffith Park. The Perkins family, family organization collaborated with the department to clean, sanitize, weed, and paint the playground at the Emil Griffith Bar Park. The second was a cleanup effort orchestrated by the Omega Sci-Fi fraternity members, cleaning the grounds and cutting the grass at the Lionel Smut Richards Bar Field and the Lionel Roberts Stadium. On the island of St. Croix, Project Promise donated and collaborated with DSPR to install playground equipment at the Princess facility. Members of the Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority spent a day of community service painting the tables and benches at the Major Cummins playground. I want to thank these organizations for giving back to our community. I would also like to thank another of our great donors, Banco Popular, for its continued support. They are funding the construction of a new batting cage at the DC Canigator ball field. I, I am incredibly proud of the construction, construction and rebuild of the Major Cummins playground in Frederick State, St. Croix. In early 2020, the Office of the Governor, DSPR, our town Frederickstead and the St. Croix Education began discussing a community build project. With funding in place on November 12, 2021, we witnessed something never done in our community before. For just two weeks, countless individuals came together with one common goal, to rebuild the playground and working alongside each other. The result is a playground that is one of a kind in the territory. I will forever be grateful to the individuals who participated in this project, no matter how big or small your contribution was. When we come together as a community, remarkable things can happen. The Major Cummings Playground Facility has been inspected by a national recognized certified playground inspector. The grand opening scheduled for earlier this month was postponed due to the rise in the territory's COVID-19 positivity rate. I am pleased to announce that the department will have a soft opening on February 1st, 2022, allowing access to the playground. The grand opening is now tentatively scheduled for the third week in February. We look forward to seeing smiling faces at that grand opening. DSPR will also be relocating two employees at that site to ensure that the facility is now supervised. We are forever grateful for the assistance that we receive. As the, adage, as the adage says, one hand washes the other. DSPR also plays its part in assisting organizations through sponsorships. For the fiscal year 2022, DSPR has already awarded $40,615 to nonprofits. We will continue to support nonprofits and individuals whose goal is to better better the quality of life for our community. 
a few of the events and programs and organizations that we have sponsors are that is day out on St. Croix, the positive, positive Guidance Basketball Club, the Lutheran Services, Lutheran Social Services, Emerald Gems Foundation, the Billiards Championship, the Illuminate Bike Ride, the Police Athletic League's Night Out, the Governor's Christmas Toy Giveaway, Jacko's Baseball Club, Project Promise, Miguel Santos DJ Dis Jockey School, the Virgin Islands Bowling Federation, Charming Twirlers Majorettes, and the Visionaries Turkey Giveaway. There have been many great program administrators through this department. Yet, we have heard the concerns from individuals that felt they were not informed about our programs. We made a conscious effort to market our programs more. You can listen to the many commercials of DSPR programs played on the local radio stations and see the increased circulation of our flyers. We often even repost them several times a day on our Facebook page so that they are seen more often. The department recently added a Twitter and Instagram page profile to our social media portfolio. Of course, we will continue to post our programs and activities in the daily periodicals. Our user-friendly website, dspr.vi.gov, also has all the department programs and activities listed. To manage that information, DSPR recently hired its first public relations officer whose responsibility is to ensure our social media outlets are updated every day. And although I didn't place his name on the record in my testimony, I would like to welcome Mr. Jerron Simmons to the department, uh, who has been with us for about a month now, uh, who will be responsible for our public information. The COVID-19 pandemic and restrictions it brought did not stop the team at DSPR from providing meaningful sports and recreation for our community. For the first, for the first time in my 14-year tenure at DSPR, the team has created a six-month tentative calendar Interested individuals can now see what the department has to offer months in advance. The calendar below is just another tool provided by the department to assist parents in planning activities for their children. Senator, because that it, it, it is a six-month uh, calendar, I, I won't say all the different programs, uh, but as you can see, the department has uh, sporting activities and your non-conventional sporting uh, recreational activities added to our calendar. Uh, we felt that this was big because now parents can plan on what they want to involve their children in. No longer is our programs just going to be advertised when we are planning to run them, but you can see them ahead of time so that whether it's the, the application fee, uh, the registration, uh, maybe you have them in some other event that you need to, to, to kind of organize, uh, we, we now have that. So I'm, I'm proud that the team was able to uh, come up with that uh, kudos to my district administrators for bringing that out uh, for, for the people that we serve. Early in the pandemic, the CDC categor categorized sports by transmission risk. High sport, high risk, medium risk, and low, low risk. Additionally, the Department of Health made recommendation based on these categories. DSPR took a close look of what sports were allowed and what were not allowed. One of the newest and more extensive programs we, we established is the Reviving Baseball in Inner Cities, or RBI Baseball Program. RBI is an outreach program created by Major League Baseball, ran by the Department of Sports, Park, and Recreation to create a love for baseball and softball, and use that love to, fo to foster the value of teamwork, achieving, achieving achievement goals, academic excellence, and community service. We are hard at work creating op opportunities for our athletes to sharpen their skills, especially those student athletes who have suffered over the past two years due to playing restrictions brought on by the global pandemic. The RBI program aims to motivate participants to stay in school and to pursue post-secondary education. RBI has, has been embraced in many communities because it teaches children that success in life takes more than succeeding on the ball field. It also means achieving in the classroom and the community. 
All student athletes registered in the DSPR RBI program must register with the NCAA Clearing House or the NCAA Eligibility Center. The NCAA Eligibility Center is the arm of the NCAA responsible for determining the academic eligibility and amateurism status for Division I and Division II student athletes. DSPR's RBI student athletes have also have access to the Major League Baseball Charities, Inc. Major League Scholarship Fund, which provide annual scholarships of up to $5,000 for up to 12 RBI student athletes who demonstrate academic achievement, leadership qualities, financial need, and wish to pursue secondary education. DSPR RBI Junior Softball 16 U Division has four teams, two from St. Croix and two from St. Thomas St. John. The Junior Baseball 15 U Division has five teams, two from St. Croix and three from St. Thomas St. John. The Senior Baseball 16 to 13 Division have three teams from St. Croix and two teams from St. Thomas. It is particularly important to note that this is a territorial league which means all teams play against each other territory-wide. Since the start of the RBI program, there have been 12 inter-island baseball games and eight inter-island softball games. I want to thank all the volunteers and employees involved in making inter-island play a reality again, especially during the pandemic. pandemic. Thank you to the Department of Health for supporting us to ensure that we travel and play as safely as possible. At the end of a successful six week entirely in person 2021 summer program, DSPR re resume offering more recreational and sporting programs. A few of these are the following. In the district of St. Croix, the DSPR program was launched August 2021 and continued through December 2021. King of the Courts, that was run September 11, 2021, October 22, 2021, November 19, 2021, and also December 17, 2021. Beach Cleanup of Kramers Park, that was August 2nd, 2021 to November 13, 2021. <coughs> DSPR Elite Boys Basketball, October 1st, 2021 to December 2021. Baseball, basic baseball clinics was held from October 4th to December 17, 2021. We also did an online GVI Jerusalem Dance Channel Challenge territory wide, which was held October 12th, 2021. Also on St. Croix, we had senior exercise workout programs at the FitLot program. That was held from on October 18, 2021, and will be running through April 22, 2022. We've held after-school after tennis clinics, which was held October 19, and ran through November 26, 2021. We did baseball clinics for beginners November 3rd to December 10th, 2021. Behind the Lights Baseball and Softball Camp was held November 6th through the 7th, 2021. Take Me Fishing Program was held November 10th through December 18, 2021. Fundamentals for Football was held December 28th through December 30th, 2021. In the St. Thomas St. John District, 12 U Baseball Clinics was held August 2021, and is still ongoing presently now, was held at Gift Hill Field in St. John. Again, the Territorial DSPR program was held in St. Thomas from August 2021 to December 2021. Eight and Up Tennis Clinics was held September 2021 and is being currently held present on Cruz Bay Tennis Courts. DSPR Fitness Training was held September 2021 to present at Winston Ramo Center. Also a territorial wide program, also in St. Thomas, GVI Jerusalem Dance Challenge was held October 12, 2021. Data modeling search and modeling practice was held October 29 to December 17, 2021 at Saturdays at the Winston Ramo facility. 
the Rugrats 3 to 5 Pee Wee Baseball League, November 2021, to present at the Joseph O'Bain Ball Field. The 8 and Up Mokojumbi Clinic, that was held November 2021 at the Cruz Bay Tennis Court. 16 and Under 3 and 3 Basketball Clinics and Challenge, November 2021 to December 2021, was held at Oville Brown Basketball Courts. 20U Baseball Clinics, November 16 to December 3rd, 2021 at the Joseph O'Bain Baseball Park. The Trevor Joseph Baseball Tournament was held December 3rd to December 5th, 2021, Joseph O'Bain Ball Field. The 8U Pee Wee Baseball Games was held December 3rd to the 5th, 2021, Joseph O'Bain Ball Field. DSPR RBI Baseball, which was a territory-wide coaches clinic was held December uh, 17 to December 20th and was held to Winston Ramos Center at the Lionel Roberts Stadium. To expand a little bit about that more, um, we made it mandatory that all the coaches that are involved in our RBI program, uh, whether you live in St. Croix, St. Thomas, or St. John, it was mandatory that you attended those, those coaches' clinics. Uh, coaches that was on the island of St. Croix, uh, the department was responsible for their, their, their fee to come over hotel so that they could uh, attend those clinics. Uh, Fundamentals Football Clinic, that was held December 28th to December 30th, 2021, at the Smith Bay Field. Senators, this department is working. To the naysayers that says that this department is not doing programs, those are programs that I just call, called out that was held between uh, the months of August uh, to current, current, and we currently have an additional uh, set of programs that we are, will be rolling out uh, currently. Kudos to all the staff at the Department of Sports, Park, and Recreation that has been involved in these programs that have been currently well, and also the volunteers um, that has assisted the department in getting these programs out. As always, I want to thank the hardworking employees at the Department of Sports, Park, and Recreation. The senior leadership team continues to find innovative ways to celebrate, encourage, and show our appreciation to our employees. <coughs> On July 2nd, 2021, Governor Albert Bryan Jr. issued a proclamation designating July 2021 Sports, Park, and Recreation Month in the Virgin Islands in conjunction with the National Park and Recreation Month, which celebrates an official day of recognition for Park and Recreation Professionals Day on Friday, July 16th. Our local parks and beaches and recreational facilities are often our first experiences with nature. Our introduction to our favorite hobby or physical activity, the proclamation said. They are places that gather with friends, and family, spaces to celebrate life's special moments, spots of quiet reflection and healing, sites that connect us with essential community service, and so much more. Governor Bryan's proclamation also noted that the role parks played during the long COVID-19 pandemic and lockdown. Local parks have been essential during the COVID-19 pandemic, with many of our community mem members finding a new appreciation for the essential spaces the Department of Sports, Park and Recreation manages and the vital high quality programs it provides, the proclamation also said. The Department of Sports, Park and Recreation employees play a vital role in maintaining and enhancing the health, safety and welfare of the Virgin Islands residents. To build further morale and team building, the senior leadership team at DSPR organized an employee appreciation fund Day filled with team building activities on Tuesday, October 26, 2021. The idea was to bring all employees together from across the territory in one location to celebrate as one team. The fun day was a small token to show how thankful we are to our employees. We wanted to recognize the hardworking men and women of the Department of Sports, Park and Recreation who are committed to, con to the continued effort of providing recreation and leisure activities to the Virgin Islands community. 
I know this was long. I felt like I just said the second state of the territory. But I want to thank you for listening to my testimony. My team and I are ready to answer any questions you may have. I also have a video that I would like media to play uh, just to let you guys see the outcome of the Media Cummings part. Media? Good day. This is Calvo White, the Commissioner of the Department of Sports, Park and Recreation. On November 12, 2021, the territory witnessed something that was unprecedented. An entire community of all ages, all walks of life, skilled and unskilled individuals shared one common goal, to improve the quality of life for our children. The Midre Cummings Community Build became a place where new friendships were formed and old disputes were squashed. For 12 days, the community came together to create something that will be talked about for decades. I am grateful to each of you who came out and shared your time on the community build. For those of you that could not make it, I also thank you because I know the project itself had your blessings. To the governor of the Virgin Islands, Albert Bryan Jr., thank you for your commitment and support. Not only did you appropriate $400,000 in the FY 2021 supplemental budget, but you granted administrative leave to government employees assisting with the project. To the 34th legislature, I thank you for your support. Many of you and your staff dedicated hours of your time on the community bill. To all government agencies, businesses, nonprofits, restaurants, fraternities, and sororities, or just individuals that wanted to be a part of the community built. I salute you. Remember, the work is not finished. I now ask the community to help PSPR to ensure that the hard work and sweat that we all committed is now protected. This park belongs to the people. At the end of the community built, in front of a crowd of about 50 people, I asked Midre to come forward so that he could be acknowledged, so that I could thank him, not just for being a son of the sword, but for taking part in the rehabilitation of the park that bears his name. His response was, and I quote, in 2001, the greatest moment of my life was winning a World Series championship. Today, that has been trumped by the rebuild of this park, end quote. On behalf of all the employees at PSPR and myself, but more importantly, on behalf of the children of the Virgin Islands, I say thank you. Senator, that concludes my testimony. And what a way to conclude your testimony, Commissioner White. I must join you in thanking all the members of the community who have come out, who came out and contributed their time, who donated not only their time, but their finances, those in the business sector. Uh, many public uh, servants came out also and gave their time, so I want to echo um, your words and expressing our gratitude to everyone who came out to make that coming, to make that possible at Mildred's coming. So it was, it, was, it was a great activity, really seeing the community together. Uh, we were saying in here that you must have um, uh, some, some, mics. some mics in here, because some of my colleagues were saying that this was a second state of the territory address. <sighs> But, but clearly it is the state of the Department of Sports Park and Recreation and your team, you and your team have done a great job. So we thank you for your service and commitment. And in spite of the challenges during COVID, your team, the workers, the employees of the Department of Sports Park and Recreation have, were out. Um, ensuring that our parks were well maintained. So thank each and every one of you. Uh, Commissioner Gabriel, uh, I don't know how you're going to beat this one, but um, you're next. 
I was just gonna say, I feel like you set me up. This is why Commissioner White should have went first, man. All of that, but I will try my best. Good afternoon, uh, Senator Samuel Carrion, Chairperson of the Committee on Youth, Sports, Parks and Recreation, committee members, all other senators in attendance today, as well as those in the listening and viewing audience. I am Derek Gabriel, Commissioner of the Department of Public Works, and with me today is Chief Engineer Tawana Nicholas. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony on our department's role in the Polly Joseph Stadium construction project. The Department of Public Works continues to manage the construction of the Polly Joseph Stadium, including the Terrence Martin softball field and the Festival Village. Work resumed on October 18, 2021, after the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, reviewed and accepted the no-rise certificate from the government of the Virgin Islands to fulfill the minimum criteria for the National Flood Insurance Program. Since then, we have completed concrete pours for the left and right dugout floors, as well as the concrete pour for the left, for the left field side of the stadium's floor slab. The project team has submitted pay requests estimate 31 and 32, which reflects the recent construction work and purchase for materials for future tasks. Change order number 14 for a supplemental contract in the amount of $4.1 million from Act number 8326 was also submitted for review and approval. The supplemental contract covers changes in the scope that were noted on the revised design drawings dated May 8, 2020, but were not previously included in the cost of the project. The project's general contractor, GEC, is fully, staffed for, is fully staffed for the construction efforts approved to date, and construction progress meetings are, held, are being held on a routine basis. Project meetings with our stakeholders, Sports, Parks and Recreation, WTJX Virgin Islands Public Broadcasting System, and the Division of Festivals are scheduled as required. We also have continued, we also have continued project coordinator meetings with the Department of Planning and Natural Resources to expedite various approvals and the permit process. Building permits, as well as the electrical and plumbing permits were submitted on December 15, 2021. Most of the permits for the project were approved on January 24, 2022. As of today, we are currently waiting for the, for the project's electrical permits to be approved by DPNR. The first of the six sections for the right field floor slab of the stadium was poured on January 14, 2022, with the second schedule with the second section scheduled for this Friday, January 28, 2022, barring any setbacks. Our, imme our, our immediate next steps are to continue with completing the right field floor slab, followed by center field stadium floor slab, and then the stadium walls for the left field. With the approval, with the approval of all permits. An updated project schedule will be prepared and submitted with the next Senate by monthly report. The new stadium will provide modern, up-to-date features for spectators and will include a triple A size baseball field, just over a thousand seats, a dedicated festival village area with an expanded promenade, and a softball slash little league field. We know the community is looking for is looking for progress, and we are pleased to say that tangible progress is indeed being made. This project is currently on schedule to be completed by March of 2023. However, it is, it is expected to be substantially complete in November of 2022. Once completed, Paul, the Polly Joseph Stadium, combined with renovations at the Vincent Mason Senior Coral Resort Park and Pool, renovations at the Fort Frederick Beach Pavilion and Bathhouse, as well as the revitalization of the Midre Cummings Recreational and Youth Facility, the the historic town of Fredrickson will have the much awaited community enhancements our people have been waiting for. DPW is proud of our role on these projects and we look forward to bringing them to completion for all Virgin Islanders, especially the people of Fredrickson. Thank you for this opportunity to testify and we welcome any questions you may have. Thank you, Commissioner Gabriel for your testimony. We would get right into questions, and we're going to, we're going to do two rounds. We're going to start, start with a first round of five minutes, and then we'll do a second round um, after the first round. So let's start off with Senator uh, Dwayne DeGraff. 
Senator De Graff, you're recognized for your five <laughs> minutes. I, I thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Commissioner Wake, you, you forgot to mention about the Savan Basketball Court. But again, thank you very much. Put up them rims. You didn't mention it, so I'm going to play your hand for you. Uh, right now, anybody talk bad about you or, or sports park and recreation, you got to fight with me, man. I mean, keep doing what you're doing. I support you 100%. Um, my thing is always to start off with employees. You, you, you had an issue with some employees last go wrong where they weren't paid. Was that rectified? I, I'll let Ms. Relina Pell, my HR sure. manager, answer that. Relina Pell. You're my resources manager. Yes, Senator DeGraff, um, both the SIU and the um, Supervisors Union, they were all paid and their back pay and they're up to step. Outstanding, outstanding. Like I say, the great work you're doing, we, we got to look out for the employees. Also, uh, Commissioner, the beach program that you had for the disabled persons to be able to enjoy our beautiful waters, how is that uh, going in the territory? <laughs> So, so we only have those beach mats at two facilities right now, which is at Kramer's Park and at Megan's Bay. Uh, we've gotten some great, great um, uh, comments from those uh, individuals who are in wheelchairs um, that are now able to go in the water. A um, couple of the other beaches that we want to put um, those, those devices currently have contractors on them. We talked about Fort Frederick, uh, Kramer's Park, uh, pavilions are going to be doing some work also. We have to do some additional ADA stuff, uh, parking and stuff. So we, we want to make sure that the, the construction is finished before we move forward. Uh, we still have the equipment. Um, they, they, they're in storage. So it's, it's just a matter of us rolling them out when we feel that no more construction is going to be going on at those sites. Okay, good. Thank you for that. Uh, I, I like to talk about cricket. Uh, I know that in the governor's state of the territory, you mentioned about cricket pitches, and you also mentioned about it. Where would those cricket pitches uh, be in the territory? One in St. Croix, one in St. Thomas. So, so let me talk about St. Croix first. I, I do know that there was an appropriation for, I think it was $2.1, $2.2 million uh, to the St. Croix Cricket uh, Club. Uh, I think that bill was pulled back to add some more language uh, in, in, in the bill, but currently on St. Croix and St. Thomas, as I stated in the testimony myself, the Cricket Association and Director Dow has had meetings where we feel pretty comfortable moving forward uh, that we are going to be able to give them some assist to at least get the cricket pitch down in Estate Nazareth, uh, which is across from the, the, the pool, where they at least can have some type of play, playing going on. Okay, good. Uh, thank you again. Uh, you know, we just had the Department of Education before us in regards to athletics for our students. And to hear you talk about king of the courts, elite basketball, football camps, and different things like that, the Department of Education seems to be hesitant with kicking off those particular sports, basketball and football. You have met the Department of Health. Uh, what are you doing different to, to conduct basketball tournaments, uh, football uh, camps and different things that the Department of Education could follow to also make that happen in the schools? Well, well, I think what my senior staff did, and I say my senior staff because they're the one who came up with the protocols and the policies, um, we, we always depend on the Department of Health for uh, their guidance um, as far as uh, the health aspect of it. Uh, but I have a bunch of athletic professionals in my, my department. And I think what they did was we, 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 we approached the Department of Health and we set forth what we thought would have been good protocols and policies that would keep our children safe and had them look over those protocols and policies and ask them to either tweak it, One um, approve, uh, let us know that this wasn't going to work. One of the big things that we did in 2020 was we created a simulation with our staff where we actually acted as if it was a, a, a real game and we invited the Department of Health to come out to see how we did that. Um, all the procedures, when you're coming into the facility, the tables, the hand sanitizers, the, the scanners that we had. And then while you're on your field, what we did in the dugouts um, on St. Croix, the facilities that are playing baseball, they have installed, uh, you know, the hand sanitizers in the dugouts. Uh, we have the temperature scans that we was able to order from COVID funds. So I think 
and, and I don't want to compete. I think we're two different departments. We're sister and brother departments. But I think what my staff did was they was pro proactive and they came up with a plan and they gave that to the Department of Health and had them look at it to approve and, 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 and see. We haven't been able to do all the sports. And I think what, what happens is we are doing a lot of training. We're doing a lot of clinics. We're doing a lot of of, of, of one-on-ones. Um, we are able to play games in baseball because that was approved. Uh, but to answer your question, short answer, we, we, we had a plan. Okay, so uh, uh, time. two final questions, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, call. Two final questions. One would be, uh, Commissioner White, you didn't mention about uh, beach cleanings. You're also responsible for beaches and stuff. In terms of the upkeep of the beaches, uh, do, do, I know you got the, the trucks. Do you have a crew set to um, keep that going? And finally, for Commissioner Gabriel, in regards to the governor said that the territory address mentioned that uh, he needs an additional $3 million for Paulie Joseph. Uh, could you itemize more or less what we are looking at that, that would that $3, that $3 million take care of? So Commissioner White, then Commissioner Gabriel, uh, thank you for the time, Mr. Chair. So, so we don't have a beach. We don't have a beach section in our department. Um, we, we tackle a lot of our projects in this department all at once. Um, you know, sometimes you'll have the lifeguards and the beach cleaning. We'll, we'll do beach cleanup days with the recreational staff. Uh, you have the sanitation workers that, that, that does some cleaning up also. But to answer your question, if we look at all the beaches in the territory, one, we don't have the staff to maintain and clean all the beaches. Uh, that's why we, we were ordering the, the beach barber machines, because that's going to be able to assist us. Um, but it, it's by a committee. This, this department really relies on each other. So if it takes, um, you know, custodian, recreation leaders, lifeguards, um, and, and all of us to come together to do it, that's, that's what we do on, on a regular basis. Okay, you can count me in with that crew, too. You can count me in on that. I'm willing to volunteer help. And then, Commissioner Gabriel, you can finalize that. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Derek Gabriel, Commissioner of the Department of Public Works. So I'd just like to add on, um, and we are continuously evaluating what we call our um, the, the add-ons, our a la carte menu. Um, but some of the items that were included in that $3 million were um, we're looking at doing some solar lighting. So changing some of the lights to solar, which I think would be a worthwhile investment, adding some additional parking. Um, we're looking at doing some um, doing some um, media additions also for the ballpark so that you could see and you know you could add like a batter's eye um, camera and support we're adding a standby generator and providing some allowances for some additional sports and concession equipment okay thank thank you everyone uh thank you mr chair thank Thank you, um, Senator DeGraff, for your line of questioning. We'll have a second round. Um, now let's go to Senator Javon James for your five minutes. One, two, one, two. Yes, good afternoon to the people of the Virgin Islands. And I'm happy to be here for the current state of the Department of Public Works, or it's just sports, parks, and recreation. I must say that whoever is training Commissioner Carver White is doing a great job. But in all seriousness, uh, Commissioner White, I just want to say for uh, your time being in our position, you're doing an awesome job and continue to do what you're doing. Um, but I'll tell you this much, and I have nothing against the governor of the Virgin Islands, but during the state of the territory, the governor said, we are going to do a cricket pitch on St. Thomas and St. Croix. And that's correct. But how he's able to do a cricket pitch on St. Croix because of Act number 8473 and Act amending the Virgin Islands Code relating to the fiscal year 2021 operating budget of the government of the Virgin Islands to appropriate $2.1 million for the construction of a cricket field in Estate Bethlehem, St. Croix, in which Senator Javon James and Senator Kurt Vialli, along with the other members of the 34th legislature of the Virgin Islands, played a role. So I just want to place that on the record. And when it comes to the, the car truck, I saw some pictures recently. I know we um, had a picture where the governor and his team took a picture with, I think, with the Car Caribbean Drag Racing Association. And it was an awesome picture holding up the check. But the current situation down there at the car truck is horrible. 
because of what is going on with our Port Authority and the Caribbean Drag Racing Association, which I will not discuss here on the floor, um, everything that the Legislature of the Virgin Islands did in the 33rd, Legislature of the Virgin Islands basically went south because down there is basically similar to a, a dilapidated property. The grass is overgrown and um, the list goes on, but I'm not here for, it's not for you to answer. And if you want to answer on somebody else's time, you could do that. But I just want to place on the record as we continue to talk about we're doing this and we're doing that, we have to face the reality. And the reality is the Caribbean Drug Racing Association is going through some challenging times. And I hope that the com director Dow and the others um, join in to help them because it's a public-private partnership. And as we speak about the state of the Department of Sports, Parks and Recreation, I just want to place on the record that at a later time, Chairman, I will be bringing some bills forward that speaks to the Virgin Islands Sports Commission and restructuring some minor stuff within the Department of Sports, Parks and Recreation based on the Virgin Islands Code that is outdated. In addition to that, at a later time, I'm hoping that this committee can bring in the Caribbean Drag Racing Association members to find out what is going on with Act Number 8449 that speaks to the, the last set of money that we appropriated from the community's facility trust fund in a total of $675,500. And it's a campaign year and everybody needs to get their credit. But I'm going to tell you this much. Because of the vice president of this legislature, the Virgin Islands, and we're going to call his name on the floor. If you don't know who's the vice president, go and Google it. The vice president is the reason why I'm here today, and I always give him that credit. But I'm going to tell you this much. It started between the vice president and myself when it came to the Caribbean Drag Racing Association. We put in a lot of hard work in the 33rd legislature of the Virgin Islands. We had so many meetings on the record and off the record to make sure that the people of St. Croix receive a car track. I have no problem with people getting the credit, but I just want to make it very clear. Give credit where credit is due, even if you do not like who is sending the message. And I know my time is about to call, but I have no questions to ask One in this state of the Department of Sports, Parks, and Recreation. But I want to ask the Department of Public Works a question, though. When it comes to the Pali Joseph Stadium, I just want you to just place some timelines in place in which the people of Fredrickstead can be able to get some sense of relief. Give us some timelines. Good afternoon, Senator Derek Gabriel, Commissioner of the Department of Public Works. So I think the two dates that we called out in our in my testimony was we are expecting um, the contract to be completed in March of 2023. Um, and we're expecting to have substantial completion in November of this year. Now that's barring, I do want to just add the disclaimer because if there's one thing that we've seen is COVID-19 has had a tremendous impact on not only supply chain, but logistics management. So of course, we're all subject um, to that one disclaimer. Thank you so much for giving us that update. I could go on and on and on, but at the end of the day, the state of the Department of Sports, Parks and Recreation is very clear. But when it comes to those two projects, the car truck and the cricket field, in which I put blood, sweat and tear in, I will make sure I defend that from now until the day I die. So let's talk about we instead of I. Thank you, Chairman Karyong, for the time. You're welcome, Senator James. You reserve the remainder of your time? If I may respond, Senator. You, you may, Commissioner White. So, so I, I, I want to put it on the record and, and, and make it clear that the Caribbean Drag Racing Association has already received half of the $675,000 uh, that was awarded to them. As the commissioner of the Department of Sports, Park and Recreation, that money came through my department. The decision was made not to release the entire $675,000. I released half of it, and I, I let them know that once they supply uh, or submit receipts and invoices of how the money was spent, the second half uh, would be released. Um, we're talking about $675,000. So they already have $375,000. As, as to, to, to 
address them not being on the track right now. Um, I, I don't really think it's Port Authority fault, and I, I don't even think it's the Caribbean Drag Racing Association fault. Uh, what what happened with that situation is the insurance have now lapsed. They do not have insurance. And just like regular citizens, if you have a car, you have to have car insurance. If you have a house, you have house insurance. Uh, the Port Authority is not willing to take the chance of having construction go on on their property without the entity having insurance. I know they have been looking for insurance. They have not find it on the island of St. Croix. Uh, so they are now dealing with uh, 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 insurance company in the states to possibly uh, get insured so that construction can start back at that facility. But I, I really don't think there's anyone to blame other than they don't have insurance right now and Port is requesting that insurance have, which, to be quite frankly, we, we don't blame them. Uh, Senator James, you're, you're recognized. Thank, thank you for resolving my time. That is a good thing about resolving time. I just want to place on the record, I never mentioned anybody's name, so who the cop fit, let them wear it, but I'm going to tell you this much. I know about certain things, and I made it very clear that I do not want to bring Dutty Lange on the, on the Senate floor. I'm going to keep it clean this year. Who wants to play dirty? Cool. But I'm going to tell you this much. I know of certain things that is being transpired behind closed doors, and I just want to make sure that as we take photo pictures and photo apps, that we continue to work with those guys to make sure that it comes into fruition. Because when I was a chair of this committee, in which I passed the torch to you, we heard many times, December 2020, carriage racing in the Virgin Islands is going to happen. It pushed back, pushed back, pushed back, pushed back, and it continued to push back. It sounded like a jamban song, push back. But I'm going to tell you this much. We want to see the car truck finish. Let's make it happen. Like I said, I'm going to keep it clean this year, and I'm not going to keep put Dottie Lange on the Senate floor. I know a lot, and I will not say it. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the time. Thank you, Senator James. And uh, just, just for the record, we did have an agenda um, to have the members of the Car Drag Racing Association present. There was a request to continue, and we gave them that opportunity and, honor, and to honor that. But we will be having them uh, shortly because we have that um, within our books to bring them in. Um, I echo the sentiments of Senator James. We want drag racing in the territory. It's been long waiting, long overdue. I know this body has done its part. Now it rests on the hands of the association along with the executive uh, branch of government uh, to make it happen. So we look forward to hearing some the status on that fully and, and a hearing in the future. Uh, Senator Carla Joseph, you're recognized for your five minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. A pleasant good afternoon to you as well as the people of the Virgin Islands and our testifiers today. Uh, Commissioner White, you did a really bang up job, you and your team, um, in presenting your testimony, both verbally and in writing. And we were just speaking about racing, so I will go to one of my favorite type of racing, which is horse racing, which is a sport of kings. And you know I would be asking about that, especially given that during the state of the territory address, our governor mentioned that there's going to be some movement specifically on both racetrack to build them up and get horse racing back on track. Do you have any updates to provide us besides what is written here and you testified on? Because the governor alluded and stated that there was going to be some movement with VIGL building back the Randolph Dock James racetrack and possibly looking at Southland Gaming doing the same for the Clinton Phipps racetrack in St. Thomas. This is a must. Our, our men uh, have invested and our people have invested sizable amount of money in horse racing. So that's, uh, that's part of our culture and our blood. So tell me if there's any update that you can provide for us. 
Sure. Um, as the governor stated in his State of the Territory Address, he will be sending down a proposal that includes uh, Southland Gaming to this body or the 34th legislature. Um, there is going to be some legislation needed uh, to ratify or approve that proposal. But, Senator, I would rather you have that proposal in front of you and see what's in there so have um, you... before I speak on, oh, on okay. what's in it. You don't have to speak on it, and I appreciate that, and I respect it more importantly. But you have been a part of sitting down with the stakeholders to negotiate that. That's all I want to know, if you say a yes or no. Yeah, I am part of the litigation, so I am, I am in front uh, with the both entities, or, or three entities, which would be BIGL, Southland Gaming, and the government. Um, so, yes, the answer is yes. Okay, thank you kindly. I'll move on because I'm hoping that you have negotiated the best uh, deal for us uh, so we could get horse racing back on track. Now, I want to uh, delve into your testimony first, and specifically I'm going to look at some of these awards that you have already awarded grantees uh, that were from appropriations that was made. I believe it is located here on page, page 12. You indicated for fiscal year 2022, you have already awarded over $40,000. Uh, would you kindly submit to the chair, through the chair, the listing of awardees that you have already uh, awarded, and these are individual organizations that have the have received the check, correct? To the chair, That's if correct. we could, if we could get a listing of that information, that would be greatly appreciated. So my time isn't eaten up because I have plenty of questions to ask you. Now, the other the other item I wanted to ask you about is relative to your sport calendar and your activities calendar, again, I want to commend you and your team. Uh, you are as great as your team, so your team should be commended. I don't see a lot of uh, activities here listed for seniors in the St. Thomas District. I do note, I do note, I mean, seniors are, are really a major part of my, my One bloodstream minute. and my heartbeat. And I note that in St. Croix, you have Senior Fit Lot Exercise Program, Senior Culture Day, and, and I'm thinking that Learn to Swim is also extended to seniors. That's a generational program you're offering. So let's try to get a balance in play. I'm not competing against or saying competing against St. Croix. Let's try to keep it balanced. Uh, so are there plans underway? Are your team looking at also infusing something for our seniors in your program and in your offerings? In I, I'll Saint let Thomas my district, district administrator for St. Thomas answer that question. Good afternoon, Kirk Thomas District Administrator, St. Thomas St. John District. Uh, to answer you, Senator Joseph, uh, as you know, in the past, we have done uh, programs with seniors. Correct. Uh, as of recent, one I just recalled, and I forgot to mention to the commissioner to add, we did do uh, a recent program at the Winston Ramos Center with some seniors getting back into the computer world again. Uh, previously, we did it with you, and we just did it uh, well two months ago at the Winston Ramos Center. But one of the biggest things on the island of St. Thomas, uh, you communicate through human services with getting the seniors to try to fill out applications or fill out applications so we know how many seniors we have, what are the needs, and the feedback is that of minimal. That's mm. our biggest thing. But to be in coordination with Department of Human Services Senior Program, that's like family. That's simple. So um, we will further get into that and the homework of the Celestino White Homes. We also, I also had some meetings up there, so that will we will be coming forth with something once we have the numbers. Great. I'm hoping that the next time you're before the body, you'll be able to report on some activities you have specifically geared to 
our elders. We have to keep them active and in shape, just as we want to uh, to stay that way as well. Now, uh, Time. Commissioner, um, may I proceed, uh, Mr. <coughs> Thank you kindly. Now, I wanted to ask a question, and I know we're going to have a next round. I wanted to ask a question relative to uh, your newest, most extensive program you have, which is the RBI. I noted that it doesn't extend to Leleche. What happened, what happened to the Leleche lead? Commissioner. So I, I'll, I'll let Miss... Miss Henry expand on that, but La Leche is three to five, and I don't think the RBI program goes that low. But I'll, I'll let Ms. Henry, my district administrator, St. Croix, uh, answer that question. As far as the age requirement. Uh, thank you, Senator. I'll allow for, uh, for Ms. Henry to, to expand on that and, and my time. Thank you. Ms. Henry? Hi, good afternoon. Jamila Henry, St. Croix District Administrator of Sports and Recreation for St. Croix. Um, so the RBI program initially was created to target those high school and junior high players um, to prepare them for college level play. Um, we actually try not to clash with Little League, and that's who mainly deals with the peewee. What we do at the SPR is we still conduct our small size clinics for ages three to five. Um, so the Leleche would fall under that program. So so it's, thank you. Um, so the Leleche has now migrated to Rugrats. That's based on your calendar, correct? Correct. That thank you correct. so much, Mr. Chairman, thank for you. the leeway. Thank you, Senator. Joseph, for your line of question. And next, the chair will recognize Senator Johnson. You're recognized for your five minutes. Good, good afternoon. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon to the viewing and listening audience. Good afternoon to Commissioner White and your fabulous team. Um, you guys did an awesome job. Um, your presentation really had us here a little blown, but um, you, you know, give yourself a lot of credit. And I, I want to start off with saying this to you. You can please some of the people some of the time. You cannot please all the people all the time. And I'm saying to you, keep pushing forward. All right? I got some quick question here to ask on page three. Contractors on site. I see you have a lot of completion date for a couple of your projects. I would like to find out the starting date. Composite Park, I see you got completion date. I see Kramer's Park Pavilion, you got completion date. Pedro Cruz Bar Park, you have completion date. When is the starting date for these projects to um, actually get going? So, so Senator, those, those what you just uh, mentioned, if you look at the heading, it says contractor on site. They have already started. Each of those parks have a contractor that's doing work right now. But I'll, I'll pass that to my disaster recovery specialist, Mr. Aaron Abel, who might have the exact date of when the notice to proceed was given to those contractors for those projects. Thank you. Uh, good, good afternoon, Senator. Those projects started in Octo October of 2021. Thank you. And um, Commissioner White? I, I, I keep hearing and bouncing around D.C. Canigata Ballpark, a lot of different projects. What's the status on the stadium, D.C. Canigata Stadium? So, so what happened with that project is there's three projects connected with one. So D.C. Canigata Big Field, D.C. Canigata Little Field, and then you have the D.C. Canigata Recreational Center. Stadium. I will say, Senator, that in hindsight, we should not have combined all three of those projects together because what happened was the center, because we was trying to see if we could make it a safe room, uh, which would have been gotten us more money, but it, it, it held up the other two projects from moving forward because it was combined as one project. As, as early as I think a month ago, we was going to make the decision to separate those projects from each other so that we could have just moved forward with the baseball field so that the recreational center would not hold it up. Uh, and then we got an a, a, a email uh, that they are no longer going to allow the recreational center as a safe room 
uh, because it's in a flood zone, Help it can only be a shelter, time, the stadium. a shelter. So we was, so we asked them the timeline that it was going to be finished, so that I could have made a decision that if it was only going to take them two more weeks to finish it as a, as a center, I was just going to keep them together. If they had told me they needed another month or two. To finish it as a shelter, I would have separated. Commissioner, but help that, me that, out. That's what the holdup was. Commissioner, help me out. I was very specific, and I asked about the stadium. I was very specific in my line of question at that time. The stadium for DC Canigata. What's the status on the stadium? The Ballfield Bleachers Stadium, Canigata. Are you asking about the contract or the the actual state it's in now? What's the, the contract? What's the status about it being renovated? Talk to me. You break up, Senator. Senator, you break up. What's the status on the stadium with the contract, the rebuild? What's going on? The stadium. I don't want to hear about those other areas for now. So, so again, because they are combined, all of them would go out at the same time as one project. And we'll probably be doing, putting that out for solicitation uh, next month. Thank, thank you very much, Commissioner. Now, let's go to Parley Joseph Stadium. As of today, how much money has been spent on Parley Joseph Stadium? So I, 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 One minute. Yeah, I assume you're talking to me. Um, to date, we have approved an approved contract cost of $22.9 million. 22.9, and I and in, in your statement you said 14 change order. Is that reflecting the amount of change orders thus far? Or that's what just a particular so I, number? So that for me again, Senator, you, you break it in up your to statement, you, 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 you initiate and said 14 change order. Was that the 14th one or that was just a number? I'm going to have to defer to um, Chief Engineer uh, Tawana Nicholas on that. Good afternoon, Tawana Nicholas, DPW Territorial Chief Engineer. Senator, the mention of the change order was the 14th change order. If I may clarify, change orders 1 through 12 were no cost change orders. We had a change order 13 that was 2.9 million. And so change order 14 is what triggered a supplemental change order for the $4.1 million. And, and then my, my next question would be to the, the contractor. How many employees you have working there on a daily basis? That would be to Mr. Wessel for GEC. Good afternoon, Senator. Thank you for the question. We have about 20 Virgin Islanders working there every day. I... I, I take my stroll every day down to that area and I deliberately walk up and shoot them bushes as high as they might be. And a lot of the times in the morning, I know there's not 20. So I have to take some walk in the afternoon now to see how many. But I, I have never seen 20 employees on that site um, when they're putting up those big rafters, those walls. Sometimes I see four or five. I, I do that. I go down there every day. I passed by that project, so I, I haven't seen 20, and I was a little bit concerned with the amount of employees I see on that site, that if we're going to meet the deadline date for completion, and do you think you're on time to complete the project on the time that is here in this contract? Yes, the answer is yes, Senator, and if you have been there in the last week or so, you probably uh, were missing the people who were out with COVID. We had about, I think, eight or nine people out with COVID last week. And we, and in addition to that, we just received our permits uh, to really ramp up the force on Monday as a result of the FEMA issues that were recently resolved. Thank you very much. And uh, back to commission. My time have been called, ma'am. Mr. Chair, my time have been called. I think, um, Mom Clerk? Did you call time? You may wrap it up. All right, thank you. Um, uh, Commissioner, I, I saw you spoke about a batting cage in D.C. Canigata. Which exact part of D.C. Canigata this batting cage is going? Uh, 
I'll let AC Hansen uh, disponge on that a little more. Um, I, I will say that it, it, we, we're not set in stone. So we, yeah. first of all, I want to say we're thankful for the donation and we want to make the best of a batting cage. Um, we have had some communication or I have had some communications with her um, as if uh, to ask if Pedro Cruz would be more of a, a middle section to the island where we could put that giving access to people from the east and also people from the well. So that is an ongoing uh, conversation. But I'll let her talk to you as far as where is the best place to put it, D.C. Canada. Good afternoon, Renee Hansen, Assistant Commissioner St. Croix. Um, Senator, we have two places that we're looking at right now. Uh, we took some measurements on the third base side outfield outside of the, the, the fencing area. We wanted to enclose that area and perhaps put put it there, make it a double um, batten cage, or we're also I, looking at an area closer to the the small office where our employees work, not the not the multi-purpose building, but the small office. So we're, it's still up in the air, um, but we did size out both areas, and both areas can hold um, a double cage. And again, as the commissioner mentioned, that we, we may relocate it um, based on need, but eventually we will have, we want to have uh, batten cages in our higher trafficked um, facilities, I, I, uh, I, baseball facilities. I highly support that because at, at some point, hopefully, Pali Joseph should be completed and that should have its own batting cage. So I highly support it in that area because that's the most heaviest used uh, park right now in the island of St. Croix. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. You're welcome, Senator Johnson. Before I go to Senator Joseph with her point of inquiry, I, I must ask Commissioner Gabriel or his engineer, Ms. Uh, Nicholas, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I heard you mention about the change orders and there have been approximately 14 of them. Is that the standard practice and procedures? What is the average in a project change orders that you would see in a, any project? So Derek Gabriel, Commissioner of Department of Public Works. Um, Senator, I will caution you by saying each project is different. Um, each project is, is an individual project and we handle them on a case by case basis. So while you have several that may come in with maybe one change order or two change orders just for time to close up, um, you have somewhere you may have 10, 15, 20 change orders. And in this case, we know that we had um, site conditions and then we also, it's a design build. Um, I'll defer to my chief engineer, Ms. Nicholas, in case she wants to add anything to that. Good afternoon, uh, Senator. Uh, I really have nothing to add to Commissioner Gabriel's statement. Um, it is clear this is a large project. Each project is um, is unique, um, and there, there has been significant site changes as resulting to the change orders. But I just want to reiterate it again, these change orders with the site conditions were no cost change orders. So some scope has been added, some scope has, has been adjusted or, or, or reduced that it resulted in zero dollars. Our first change order that resulted in a cost was change order number 13. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I did get from uh, your response that uh, change order from 1 to 12 was no cost. Uh, so no cost to the government um, from 1 to 12. But um, doesn't change orders and constant change orders delay the process and the progress of the construction? Yes, in some, uh, Derek Gabriel, Commissioner of Public Works. Um, yes, in some instances, and in this case, I think those delays were warranted just to make sure um, that we're not only addressing all the concerns for FEMA, but making sure that the site is safe and adequate and structurally sound um, for a project of this size and magnitude. Very well. Can you provide um, briefly maybe some examples of some of these change orders and the, and the rationale behind of them? Because I think the public would like to understand a little bit. You don't have to go through each one, but maybe the ones that stick out the most. Yeah, I'll, thank you for that. I'll defer to um, Mrs. Nicholas on that. 
So I'm looking here at the periodic estimate that um, on the second page, it has a schedule of change orders. So if I look at change order number three is additional geotechnical investigation. And that change order was uh, zero cost. If I skip down to change order number six, it was surcharge earthwork. Change order number seven, locating existing utilities. Um, change order number 11, design and scope of work changes for the revised budget. So at times, change orders also document the change um, in scope the change in some line items so that our project changes, and I'm saying changes too many times, but so that the changes are well documented. Thank you. Um, at this moment, the chair would like to recognize the presence of non-committee member Genevieve Whitaker. Thank you, Senator Whitaker, for uh, joining us this afternoon. Uh, Senator Joseph, you're recognized for your point of inquiry. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. I did have a, a question I wanted to follow up with Mr. Wessel relative to the number of persons he have working on the site. Are you still in uh, the business of providing training and apprenticeship opportunities uh, to Virgin Islanders on your work site? And is, G is the Pauly Joseph Stadium one of those work sites that you provide this training to our local uh, young people and, and apprentices. Good afternoon, Senator. Thank you for the question. I know that training is near and dear to your heart and, and greatly appreciate that. And yes, we are planning to with the delays that occurred from the FEMA. We haven't really had the chance to start that efficiently yet. We currently have two trainees on the site who are new hires and are being taught the concrete form construction uh, on the job site, and we hope to expand that over the next few weeks. Thank you kindly. Thank you, Senator Whitaker. Senator Novell Francis, you recognize your five minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Mr. Chairman, and, and good afternoon to you, and good afternoon to the testifiers, and thank you for your testimony. Uh, Commissioner White, the state of the sports park and recreation is th not only thriving, thriving, but certainly alive and well and we appreciate the work that you're doing there. I had an opportunity to visit um, Glenn and did in fact see the new fence that went up there and all the work that you're doing there. So thank you, um, you know, taking care of the hometown and making sure that we continue to get these uh, parks in the neighborhoods up and running. In respect to your programs, are you requiring any mandate uh, for vaccination for these programs? or some type of testing? What, what is your protocol? Uh, no, we're not, but I'll defer to our policies and procedures to Assistant Commissioner Roberts. Good afternoon, Vincent Roberts, Assistant Commissioner, St. Thomas, St. John District. Um, no, Senator, we are not requiring um, vaccination, but we do require testing when it comes to the traveling portion of our programs, which is mostly the RBI program. Very well, thank you for that. Um, I think the public had a concern about that, so I'm sure they heard that. In regards to the car track, um, Commissioner, I have also reached out to a Director of Port Authority, Mr. Carlton Dow, in respect to the um, liability insurance that's, that's being required uh, rightfully there, and we're trying to work through that particular issue, so we're hoping to have some some conversation later on this week in respect to that uh, so that we can move that car track forward. In the absence of having a, a horse track, I think it's critical that we're able to really get our car track up and running. So um, I really want to go quickly to the Polly Joseph Stadium. Mr. Wessel, good afternoon. When was the last time concrete was poured at the, the site? Uh, good afternoon, Senator, and thank you for the question. The last concrete was poured last Friday. Last Friday, and um, you do have uh, a schedule, a projected schedule of work um, occurring there that you could share with the with the body. The projected schedule of work, uh, if we typically do a two-week look ahead, 
uh, schedule. And if you're asking more extensively than that, I would have to get back to you. But the two the two week look ahead includes two more pours on the mat slab and the first floor pour of concrete for the main walls of the stadium. Okay, so that that'll be poured. That that would that's scheduled to be poured in the next two weeks. You're saying? Yes, Senator. That's correct. Correct. Thank you. Thank you. There. And uh, Commissioner Gabriel, who who do you have overseeing that project currently? Derek Gabriel, Commissioner, Department of Public Works. Um, currently, Miss Mrs. Nicholas is managing that project. Very well. And there is a a requirement, a mandate, based on the approval of the 4.1, with an additional 4.1 for the legislature to receive a report. Um, I have not seen a report come through uh, my desk in, in, in some time now, um, so we may be uh, logging a little bit behind. I know that we have a new commissioner in place, but um, that, that is that is required. So if you want, if, if, I'm sorry, Senator. We did send one, I think it was either on the 31st or shortly thereafter with maybe on like the 2nd. But 31st. we did submit one to the Senate president um, for her distribution to the body. 31st of what? Of December. Of December. 2021. Okay, I'm not seeing that yet, so I'll, I'll look out for that or ask the president's office in regards to that. Um, that certainly would have aided us in being able to be, be prepared for this right today. Um, I want to go back quickly to Commissioner um, White. Commissioner White, is there any plans? I know that there was some discussion before in regards to putting some sheds over... Um, at least as a pilot over a couple of basketball courts throughout the territory, one in each island to begin with. Um, have you been able to develop any further discussion in respect to that or the need for funding to, to make that a reality? I, I think that we have, there have been some concern about individuals being able to play basketball during the day, um, of course, when the sun is hot and the shed would have allowed them to be able to, to do some of that. Yeah, I, I, I have had Commissioner White, Department of Sports, Park and Recreation. I have had numerous conversations uh, with the chair of, of, of this committee, uh, Senator Carrion. Um, <clears throat> great, fruitful conversations. Um, and the last conversation that we did have was we, we was going to try to do one in the St. Croix District and one in the St. Thomas St. John District uh, as a pilot pro program. Uh, but I think the senator can speak more about that as he was going to uh, appropriate some funds uh, for that project. Very well. We, we could go back and take a look at it, but I think there were some funds appropriated some time back uh, to be able to do a pilot in all three islands. I know that Senator, former Senator Sanchez might have been the bill proponent on that. 2022 fiscal budget, sorry. Uh, there is, I think, $150,000 appropriated for um, a shed construction over a court in St. Croix and one in St. Thomas. My, my, my correction. Okay. All right, so we could um, look forward to seeing that in the, in the near future with the other success stories that you, you spoke about uh, today. One minute. Uh, yeah, I, I've already been working with uh, some committee members at the Pedro Cruz uh, in that estate profit uh, area. Um, they already have a, a design that I probably would use as a guide um, to do that. This is a long-standing project that I think we tried to do with the last administration, um, but it is something that I would try to get done in the near future. Very well. And Mr. Wessel, um, once again, what is the difficult part of, of, um, of this build out right now. Are you experiencing any severe difficulties, any barriers? Um, I know that permitting and everything has been uh, taken care of. What, what has been or what is the challenge for you at this time in moving this project forward outside of the COVID um, of manpower you just you mentioned? What, what is the difficulties you're experiencing? Uh, the difficulties we're experiencing were described briefly by Commissioner Gabriel the supply chain issues that are having are happening throughout America with the uh, trucking issues and material issues. But we, we have those pretty well under control. We try and order our materials far enough in advance. And uh, the, and that's pretty much the main challenge right now. now. Now that we've gotten past the FEMA issues, that was the biggest challenge uh, to date. Okay, very well. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, for the time. Uh, Commissioner Gabriel, I see 
The maintenance building over at Vitran, over at Public Works, is progressing well. I see we could tell it's the election year. It's raining black gold throughout the island. A lot of roads is being patched and fixed. Let's let's make sure that we patching all the holes. Don't leave. I see some being patched and others not. So if we're gonna patch, let's patch all of them. But um, yes, it's raining black gold in in the Virgin Islands um, for the election year. So that's a good thing. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, for the time. You are welcome, Senator Francis, for your line of questioning. Um, I, I would like to say yes, um, in this uh, physical budget, we did appropriate funds um, for the pilot program for both districts, St. Thomas, St. John, and St. Croix, to have a roof on the courts as a pilot program to then continue working on some other courts. So I'm hoping that we will see that uh, soon that would go out for bid and you will see the process for that. So just wanted to clear that up. Um, Senator um, Alma Francis Halliger, you recognize. Good afternoon, good afternoon. Hi. How are you? <laughs> um, first of all, I wanna thank you um, to my colleagues, to the listening audience, to the public. Um, the first set of questions I want to ask is very direct. I would like to know, Ms. Commissioner White, what are some of the relationships with organizations that you attempt to foster to really create partnerships with yourself and sports, parks, and recreation to assist with really pushing programs within your agency? Is he frozen? Um, sir, you are mute. Commissioner Sorry. White, you're, you're, you're muted. On mute. I, I apologize. I apologize. Oh, it's okay. Uh, it, you know, it, it, we, we, we have been fortunate with that, you know, a lot of the nonprofits and, and, and charity uh, organizations, organizations approach the department to assist us. Um, we never turn anyone away. Um, we, we see it as a win-win situation. So we welcome people to, to, to help us out. I mean, we could always use the help. Um, but uh, to be honest with you, Senator, I, I don't think we really go out and we look for individuals to partner with. Um, it, it's really the other way around. We have a lot of organizations that, that come to the department that want wants to help us out. Definitely. Well, with any of those partnerships, are any of them geared towards crime and reduction of um, crime in our community, specifically with our youth? Um, one of the sponsors that we just gave uh, late last year was with um, the, the night out with VIPD. They did one in St. Thomas, they did one in St. Croix, um, and they did it at our facilities, and we also gave them financial uh, financial support. So, you know, we support what they do. Um, it, it assists us with the children that we see at our facilities. Um, so, yes, that would be one of the program that, that we partner with, which is VIPD. Okay, definitely. Well, one of the things that, you know, we're dealing with sports, parks, recreation. Um, do you guys have a strategic plan within your agency to assist with childhood obesity and how we could handle that, especially here in our territory? Um, we, we don't. I, I can tell you one of the things that we'll be having a conversation on tomorrow, me and my senior staff, is, uh, as the governor mentioned in the state of the territory, uh, he wants to dedicate a million dollars to do a wellness program territory-wide. Uh, I, I am involved in those conversations. Uh, we have spoken to several uh, people about getting that wellness program off the ground. Um, and the great staff that I have uh, seems to want to take on that task themselves. Uh, well, let me not speak for all of them. Uh, one of my 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 staff uh, thinks that we have the capabilities to run that wellness program, so it is something that we will be speaking about uh, this week. That will address that those concerns, obesity, diabetes, all that stuff. We want to do some fun programs, uh, exercise programs that are going to address those concerns. Okay, good, good. Um, I wanted to get, you had spoken about resurfacing, striping of the various tennis courts, basketball courts. Do you have a deadline or a specific time as to when these things are going to be completed? 
So bo both contracts do have a deadline. I will say, Senator, that the contractor did act for, um, did send in a change order for more time. Uh, one of the issues that the contractor for the resurfacing is facing is material. Uh, we are seeing mm -hmm. that with regular construction, finding you know lumber and all of that. It was my hope when we did this project that we would have the contractor on both um, islands at the same time, or both district at the same time. Uh, that has not happened because of the shortage of material. Uh, currently, they're at the Fort facility in St. Croix. Uh, once he finishes that, he's going to do, I think, three, four facilities uh, in the St. Thomas, St. John district. But hopefully, if we can start getting more material in, then we could go back to the original plan where we'll have work being done in, 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 in both districts at the same time. That's good. Um, well, as you're speaking about dealing with construction, who exactly deals with the day-to-day -day operations and overseeing um, some of these projects? Mr. Aaron Abel, who is my disaster recovery specialist, is responsible for that, and he's on, he's online. Okay, Aaron, how are you? Good afternoon, Senator. Good afternoon. So when it comes to these projects and keeping up with them and potentially limiting change orders that could cost the government additional monies, how do you deal with this on a day-to-day -day basis to make sure that these projects do finish in a timely manner and stay within cost that was originally negotiated? Well, there's, there's two things here at hand. When it comes to change orders, change orders may be for additional time or for additional work that may not have been in the initial scope. Remember, most of our repairs to our facilities are hurricane-related damages. Our hurricanes were over four years ago. In the subsequent time between the hurricanes and presently, further deterioration and other issues come up in our facilities, which at some times necessitates change owners in order to complete the job properly and to make it look right. Okay. 30 seconds. Good, good. Well, I think, go ahead. Were you saying something else? No, that wasn't me. Okay, thank you. Well, when you spoke earlier about the honeymoon project, what happened to it since you shifted the funds? Or well, what's going to happen? Yeah, so we're able to use those funds now uh, for additional projects. So I have used I give you an example. We just, like I said, purchased two John Deere tractor trailers. Um, mm -hmm. In the past, we had to go to public work to borrow their machines and use those machines. We have competent people on our staff that can use those heavy equipment. So we just purchased one for the island of St. Croix, and we purchased one for St. Thomas, St. John District. <coughs> um, so we have that already, and, and funds was used from the honeymoon project to purchase that. Um, I'm, I'm going to be purchasing, like I said, some additional basketball rims. Uh, some of the rims at some of the facilities are old and need to change out. We are also using that. And probably the, 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 the bulk of the funds are going to be spent converting the high-pressure sodium uh, lights that we now have at the facilities to LED lights. Time. Oh, that would definitely have some cost savings. Well, they just called time for me, so thank you guys for giving me pertinent information as to my questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome, Senator Francis Heiliger, for your line of questioning. Uh, Commissioner Gabriel, uh, let me ask you, with regards to Polly Joseph, Polly Joseph Stadium, um, it has been three months since work resumed. What specifically has been accomplished in this time, or what percentage of the overall project would you say represents? So, good afternoon, Senator uh, Derek Gabriel, Commissioner for the Department of Public Works. I don't exactly have a percentage. I don't know if John has a percentage, but we did do, um, since we've resumed, we have had a number of concrete pours that have happened. So, we completed concrete pours for the left field and right field, and I'm sorry, left and right dugout floors, as well as a concrete pour for the left field side of the stadium yeah, slab. And we've also got a number of uh, pours. Maybe your um, engineer who is in charge uh, might know the percentage. Sure. Tawana, you want, do, you, do you have a percentage handy? Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Tawana Nicholas, APW, Territorial Chief Engineer. Um, I do not have a percentage handy. Um, I don't know if John 
uh, Wessel would have would have one. Good afternoon, Senator. Thank you for the question. The percentage complete is kind of a, uh, a complex question for this because it is a design and build, and the design workfall is uh, a significant portion of it. With the changes that have been requested by the government of the Virgin Islands, uh, the design cost is probably close to 20 percent of the whole project, and that's pretty much complete. Um, there were a couple of changes during different administrations uh, that, that greatly affected both the time, as you alluded to before, on change orders and the cost according to that. Right now, these, the foundation is uh, the foundation work. All of the concrete piles um, are, have been installed for quite some time, and work was halted before the mat slab was done. The mat slab is somewhere around 40 percent complete. And we expect that to be 100% complete in the next maybe 60 to 90 days, depending on uh, depending on weather and the availability of concrete. Subsequent to that, the uh, the, the walls will be built, and those uh, those constitute a relatively minor percentage of the work. I believe that would be less than 10% of the whole work. And then the you know, the interior finishes for the uh, for the locker rooms and the public restrooms and private restrooms, and then the arrival of the bleachers is expected sometime uh, late summer. I must say that I, I personally have a problem when public work doesn't know what percentage um, of the project has been completed and is responsible for overseeing this project. Um, that really doesn't sit well with me as to it really sends a message that the contractor has full reign of what's happening and we are not really following through with supervising the process that is happening. So I would just ask that public work, uh, please do do have their due diligence in following through. Um, uh, Mr. Wessel, may I ask, um, uh, how, how much have you received thus far uh, for this project? Um, who was that question for? For Mr. John Wessel. Are you talking about the terms of dollars, Senator? In terms of dollars, yes, sir. Yeah, to date, the uh, project has billed about $18 million that has been received. $18 million have been received. I, Commissioner, um, Senator Johnson, you're recognized for your point of inquiry. I, I, I hear Mr. Wessel say 18, and I think when I asked the question, I had a response from the commissioner of 22.9. Am I correct, Commish? That is correct, Senator Johnson. I think I misunderstood your question. The 22.9 million that I gave you was the approved contract cost to date. So I apologize if you're asking about uh, monies, um, how much was billed to the project. That was my misunderstanding. Okay, thank you. I will allow my other colleagues to continue asking questions and I will continue my questions in a bit. Senator uh, Payne, you're recognized for your five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, can you hear me, sir? Mr. Chair, can you we can hear, hear, we can hear you, Senator. We Payne. can hear you. Okay, good. Okay, excellent. Um, Commissioner White and Tessafarius, good afternoon. Um, as it relates to drag ship, I heard my colleagues mention in the drag ship um, and St. Croix. I too am kind of excited about opening day as uh, the GDPP bug is supposed to go up against the PAL bug that's being worked on by. My good friend from Christian said, Senator Johnson. So that day, opening races will be uh, something a, a serious sight to see. Um, and also, as it relates to drag strip, um, I'll be reaching out to you in about the next uh, four or five weeks as we, the investors, have met with uh, Provident Procurement and are submitting an LOI for about 10 acres on St. Thomas, where they propose to build a brand new state of the art drag strip on St. Thomas as well. So we now have drag strips in both districts very soon. 
Uh, Commissioner White, your report is extensive listing of dates on our projects on all three islands. One project I failed to see an update on, and it's near there to me because you know it's on Little Big Island. Uh, you specifically mentioned that it could generate some significant revenue for the department is the facility at Oppenheimer Beach. Uh, any updates on when that can be completed? Yeah, thank you for that, Senator. So o Oppenheimer Beach was um, deemed ineligible uh, for FEMA funds because of the location where it's located right in front of the water. Uh, we have already submitted information, not information, a request from uh, ODR uh, to get some insurance proceeds to fund that project. I have about $25,000 in, in, in PFA funds. Uh, just last week, the Department of Public Works uh, was on the island of St. John with their engineers and with Mr. Hill uh, going over the scope of work that needs to be done on Oppenheimer. Uh, but it, it will be uh, refurbished and rebuilt. Uh, that was probably just an oversight um, on my part that it wasn't listed, but it is one of our facilities that we are um, doing the work to get it re rebuilt. Okay, uh, and you said that you, you don't have the funds uh, at this time? We, we don't have all the funds, um, but we're still coming up with a cost estimate. I don't think we got the cost estimate of what it's going to cost uh, for that entire facility, but I, I'll let um, Deputy Director Elroy Hill respond because he was there with public work engineers just last week when they did a site visit. Okay, thank you. All right, good afternoon, Senator. Um, good afternoon, sir. Yeah, we met last week and uh, with public work, Mr. McLean, and we um, and also with the the architect from uh, architect form, and um, they're working on the um, scope of work and the drawings up as we speak. So as soon as we get there. Okay. Uh, okay, thank you very much for your response. Uh, Commissioner White, so you can uh, alter the screen again. Um, you stay with us. Commissioner White. Please hold the, please okay, hold the Senator's uh, time. Okay. Okay, let me move to um, Commissioner Gabriel since Commissioner White looked like he kind of, uh, he's come uh, maybe acting up now. Commissioner Gabriel, uh, you mentioned that the project, um, probably judges, is uh, scheduled to be substantially completed by November 2022. Uh, what exactly does that mean compared to the, the anticipated March 2023 full completion goal date? Yeah, um, Derek Gabriel, Commissioner, Department of Public Works. So we're anticipating at that point we'll have um, most of the final work complete. Um, I know like we, we've been talking about little uh, minor finishing up. Um, like we know we had some also some additional site work that will probably be wrapping up at that point. Um, probably will have installation of the generator, generator, excuse me, the standby generator going on in those three to four or five, three to five months um, between substantial completion and final completion. One minute. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Commissioner Wait, um, come a couple months ago, well, a while back, I asked you about um, the open hammer facility, and I tell you that we had at the time to, 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 to the center, we had you know funding to take care of it. And you said, uh, you had funding for from, for your, your as well as the funding to ODR. But, um, if you still need funding, um, that's something we can definitely still work on. Okay, so just shoot my email and stuff, and we can make that happen. Um, for the listening of you in the audience, for, um, let us know the various types of programs and events or sporting events that you have planned for Poly Stadium. And is it still slated to be the, the home of the Festival Village and St. Who is Who is the question to? You, you, you Commissioner White. So you're, you're asking if it's still home to, uh, uh, for the Festival? No, 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 I'm asking you to, I'm asking you to list this type of different programs and or sporting events that you have planned for the Poly Joseph Stadium. And is it still slated to be the festival, the home for the Festival Village? Time. To answer the last question first, the answer is yes, it, it still is home for the Festival Village. Um, the distance of that field, I, I think it's 319, if I'm not mistaken. Help me out, Commissioner Gabriel. Um, we, we can do a number of different tournaments. Obviously, uh, I think with that, um, it now gives us a, a, a first-class stadium where we can hold bigger tournaments. Um, 
you know, the Caribbean Little League tournaments. I mean, there's a lot of stuff we can do in there. I, I will caution and say that I, I hope um, I hope that we don't turn uh, that baseball field into what we've seen at some of our facilities where we see them for multi-purpose use that they shouldn't be used for. Um, spending $27 million on a facility, I, I think if we're getting it for baseball, um, I, I mean, I don't mind shows and stuff going to be there, but those type of events damage the field. Um, and then, you know, the department have to come in after and, and kind of uh, rehabilitate it. So uh, it, I hope it will be just for sporting events, to answer your question. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your response, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much for the time. Uh, I'll take you on a second round, if, if we have a second round, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Payne. <laughs> Senator Saro. <coughs> I'm not sure Senator Sarah is back on. Uh, Senator uh, Whitaker, you're recognized for five minutes. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Jump a lot in clear. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good, good afternoon, Senator. You may proceed. Senator Whitaker, can you hear us? <laughs> yeah, just make you okay. I'm sure you can hear me. Okay, because I was, I, I was. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, good you, afternoon you, to you, Chairman. Good afternoon to the testifiers, and I just want to uh, first just dive right in, uh, Commissioner White. I want to start off with um, in your testimony. You spoke of the fact that the um, we're talking about the uh, Randall Dock James racetrack that through an amendment um, that paved the way um, for the forward movement. And I just want um, clarification because I've been taking part in a number of the which uh, there, there are few meetings, but um, the ones I've been able to participate in um, concerning um, the, the the agreement. And I remember the last um, board meeting I attended, I would that wasn't made clear to me. So was that something that came before the legislature? Because I'm, uh, if you can clarify that for me, um, even to the public, um, that meant that is amendment forthcoming, or or um, would the agreement amend, and how would it be amended without legislative approval? Just for clarification. I am not sure if it came to the legislature. I don't know if the governor sent it down. Uh, what it did, what it allowed the vendor to do was separate uh, the two tracks in the original franchise agreement. Both tracks were tied together. Uh, it had allowed the vendor to now focus on the St. Croix track. Um, that was the amendment. Okay. Yeah, because I was just a little unclear um, if what, you know, because uh, I mean, I understood it would need legislative action, just, a, just the same of other agreements. Um, so that's what's unclear in that. And then also to, um, to um, concerning the, the racetrack, are there any um, FEMA projects um, associated with the racetrack? Yes. Yes. And what are the we was awarded? We were awarded, um, I think, three point nine million dollars for the Clinton Phipps racetrack, and we were also awarded, I think, three point two million for the Randall Jack James uh, racetrack. Those funds are still there; they have not been expended, uh, pending the outcome of the litigation or whatever. Uh, adjustment or amendment might be do done um, on the racetracks. And to clarify, the project is for a, a number of, for, for, for what exactly on the property? Um, uh, so on Clinton Phipps racetrack, we lost the concession area, we lost the, 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 the restroom facilities, uh, there was damage done to the stables, uh, the the running surface there was damage done there uh there was some damage done on the bandstand uh it, it basically covered the entire uh facility thank you thank you for that 
And in your testimony, you, you spoke about the um, you, you spoke about the Rudy Krieger complex, and you said that the Department of Property and Procurement is in the process of drafting construction contracts. So, is that uh, a new template that they're uh, generating? Is um, is that a cause of delay, or this is just something a standard um, practice in terms of um, contracts? I understood that they had just a you know they have template contracts, and I wasn't aware there was a specific co uh, construction. I know, they, I know they have contracts that address construction. But just to clarify on that, they knew. So, so just to put on the record, that facility came up over budget. We didn't have enough monies to to to, to complete the entire project. Uh, we did request some additional funds from ODR, which was granted and approved. We now have the complete uh, financial obligation of the government to 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 proceed with that. A contractor already won the bid, um, was awarded the bid. Um, and again, like I said, I, I, the contracting phase is, is different steps. I, I don't want to speak for DP, DP, DPP. Um, it might be at the Department of Justice right now. I don't know. It might still be in their, their shop. But, but all contracts of that size has to be signed off on the Department of Justice. Uh, once it is approved, it will be given to the contractor and then a notice to proceed. Thank you for that. And lights. We, I know you've, a lot of persons call you about lights. They also contact us as... as, as Senators, um, a lot of poor lighting at the different facilities as they are right now. Um, how are the coordinating efforts um, with the other agents, you know, the agency that's responsible to help you um, light up the facilities? What are the, what's the status of um, the lighting at the parks? Um, yes, number so, of parks so, are dark at night. So, so I think our LED project is going to address a lot of that. Um, currently, like I said, we have the high pressure pressure sodium lights at all of our facilities. In about five years. Uh, trying to find material for those lights is going to be obsolete. I'm just not going to be able to find material to replace them. So we made the decision. Fortunately, we were approved by FEMA to use some funds uh, from the 428 Honeymoon Project. Uh, but, it, you know, converting all of our current lighting system to LEDs is going to save the government of the Virgin Islands money. Uh, it's just a better lighter system. You get more light on the facility. Um, one of the experiences that I tell people all the time when we lose power at a facility with our current system, it takes about 20, 30 minutes for those lights to, cut, to come back on. Uh, with converting to the LED system, if they go off for a power outage, uh, they come on right away. Um, so it, it helps us as far as just improving and moving into a, a new era. One of the things that we want to do is convert all of our lighting system onto one system. So what that means, Senator, is really I am going to be able to control the lights of our facilities uh, from a computer. So we have a problem now where some of our facilities don't have timers. Uh, there is access to turn on lights and turn off lights. Um, for whatever reason, sometimes people leave the facility and leave the lights on. Um, I've gotten called 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning that, that a light on. We would now be able to now uh, address those issues uh, turn on our lights, turn off our lights uh, using new technology. Time. So we're very excited well, I just about it. Well, I'll uh, just wrap up, Chairman. Yes, you may. I may. I just wanted to, just in closing, just to say to you, Commissioner White, um, I really appreciate I want to put that out to the public so they can also understand that communication with you. And I just want to thank you and your team. You have a really dynamic team um, where, you know, it's, it's just a lot of good communication. I have asked you about updates. Um, Petro Cruz Park last year updates about um, you know what's going on with the racetrack even when it first the monies was first allotted to you um, your department so um, let's just continue let's just continue this relation I just would um, just emphasize um, I know um, the, the one thing that I think I brought up to you most recently was the um, plan that. Um, that the department should put out as it pertains to the recreation plan for Lagoon, as an example. And let's just continue to work on, you know, legislative initiatives surrounding um, infrastructure and even community centers. So I want to thank you and thank you, Chairman, for the time. Thanks. Thank You're thank welcome, you. Senator. Uh, Commissioner White, following that same line of question, uh, have you, your department, consider about uh, putting solar lights on some of our parks? Yeah, we have. I've, I've had conversation with Kyle Fleming um, just as recently when we completed the uh, Major Cummings facility. Uh, and he's assured me that he will be looking to the department to uh, bring forth some of his pilot programs. So it is a conversation that we are having 
uh, with the Department of Energy. I'm glad to hear that, and I'm sure there are grants available for parks, some federal grants available for um, solar lights for our parks, so I encourage you to continue in that dialogue, and I would like to hear in the future um, some results in regards to that, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, Senator uh, Giddings, I would like to recognize the presence of non-committee member, Senator Kenneth Giddings, you recognize now for your um, five minutes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon to all. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm a non-committee member, so I wasn't here uh, earlier, but I know that uh, there were some testimony uh, given uh, with regards to the Frederick said waterfront project. And what I wanted to know was uh, some additional information on the, if there's a time frame on the Frederick said waterfront project uh, that's supposed to be uh, taking place. Uh, up at Marley Beach, uh, I was gonna put up some uh, pictures, but they're not uh, prepared. But uh, commissioner and uh, staff, you all are aware as to what the condition is at the Marley Beach. With those broken uh, benches, broken uh, concrete tables, with the exposed, uh, uh, what you call it, <coughs> steel, et cetera, that's posing a hazard to the people uh, that traverse in these areas. So what I want to ask is what's the timeline for the start of this project and the completion? I know that uh, the park, the Midre Cummings Park, has been uh, taken care of or received a lot of attention. I know the basketball courts, uh, kudos for that. I visited the basketball courts and the tennis courts and whatnot. But I really want to know about the waterfront itself, the project with those chain links and the concrete tables and benches. So, so I'll let Mr. Abel uh, more expunge on that. I just got the scope of work for approval, um, I think, last week. Uh, Senator, it does include the Mali, all the way down by Mali with the chains and... and pillars, uh, but I, I let Mr. Abel expunge because he's the one that's working with the engineers as far as the scope for that project. Good afternoon, Senator. Yes, uh, we just got the preliminary scope for that project, which entails from Mali all the way down to Boro Park, which includes the chains that are exposed, the broken pilasters, the tables, the benches. Also, it's going to include the expansion of the electrical repairs that are needed for the Vern Richards Park on the waterfront. Um, the, we made some adjustments to the scope this past week, and the final scope should be back to us next week. So then we can forward it on to Public Works and prepare documents to have bids come in to address that project. Uh, I would say a fair estimate probably would probably be, but maybe within another 60 days or so, uh, the package will be put together so that they can go out for bid. So I'm hearing of all these scope changes, but I mean, uh, you from the Frederick said area as well, so you would know exactly what I'm talking about with that hazard, with the broken, yes, um, with the broken concrete benches and, and tables and whatnot. What does it take to address uh, these things so that there is no accident? Fortunately, no one have been injured to our knowledge uh, yet, and we don't want to wait until then. What what could uh, happen in the interim to address those? They need to be removed if they're going to be replaced. So I guess my question will be, what would it take to just move those um, broken uh, tables and benches? Well, I, I would say... And the columns you know, with the rebars, right, I'm sorry. And the columns with the rebars. I couldn't remember the rebars. Yes. Yes, yes. Um, at some point, there will be, but before we do that, uh, we need to have the final engineering done. Uh, in, in some instances, we get, have to have DPNR involved because, as you know, some of those things that are exposed help retain the soil and so forth. So we just can't take them up and move them because it's going to affect the, the overall 
uh, effect of the project. But uh, we're going to try our best to expedite the process to mitigate any uh, further M possibilities of Mr. Abel, I'm not talking oh. about uh, the, the, what the areas that I'm talking about they have nothing to do with the uh, holding the door together or, or nothing like that. I'm talking about up on Mali Beach where people utilize this thing on a daily basis. I wouldn't even say every Sunday, on a daily basis, where they're sitting on these benches and a lot of them have these exposed um, steel, um, steel coming out of them and, and whatnot. And you see children running around and jumping from, from one end to the next. And I'm saying that we're waiting for something to happen. That we don't need DPNR's permission to address. What would it take to condemn that? And if, if, if we're going to go through this back and forth, then I will ask that the commissioner, the next time you're on St. Croix, let's personally take a walk down there so that you can see exactly what I'm talking about. But we shouldn't even go another day another week with seeing these things like that. I'm telling you, this is something waiting to happen. Time. Any response? Senator, I would take you up on that. I, I, I know exactly where you're talking about and the bars that are exposed. Um, I would also invite, like I said, an, an engineer um, from PW to, to, to assist and giving us advice on what we can do um, to rectify that situation. Okay. Uh, bar none, in the interim, we, we could probably tape it off um, with some police tape, but I know we've done that uh, in the past. I know with the last time, that's what we did. That's not going to last too long. But I, I'll get with Mr. Gabriel. Um, I'm not, not no expertise in, in construction and see what does he suggests as far as us you know, rectifying that situation. May, may I wrap up here, uh, Mr. Chair? Yes, you may wrap up. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, so I'll, I'll take you up on that. Let's, let's uh, personally go down there because I'm telling you, we don't need an engineer to tell us to, to, to condemn this thing before something happens. Uh, what I wanted to find out from your agency as well, because I don't think we do a good job at selling ourselves, and I know that your agency has been working feverishly. Uh, you have some assistant commissioners there that have energy out of this world. And good things are happening the within the sports parks and recreation. But do you have a, a, a public relations person within your office? <laughs> yeah, we, we do, Senator. Um, I, I mentioned that just now in the testimony. We recently hired a public information officer three weeks to a month ago. He's currently on board. And he's handling all of our media output to the community. Well, you let Dwayne Weeks know that he's supposed to be the next popular guy on the block going forward because you have a lot of things going on within your agency and the people of the territory needs to know what's going on and how things are uh, progressing. In the District of St. Croix, I must say, uh, and I'm not sorry to say, things are moving too slow. It really appears that, that things are not happening. As I went to St. Thomas and I'll close off here uh, for the State of the Territory Address, driving from the airport to Mandela Circle, I almost thought that I was in Miami or, or, or uh, Palm Beach or someplace. And exactly what I'm seeing there with how they're uh, taking care of, of, of the media and et cetera is exactly what I've been asking of the Public Works Commissioner uh, uh, and not just, just this commissioner, previous commissioner as well. Uh, so why we seem to have two different specs going on with our roadside cleaners, whereas when you look at our highways on St. Croix, it looks like a dump versus what we're seeing going on in the next island district. We could do better, and uh, Commissioner Gabriel, we too will have a, a talk on this. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Gittins, for your line of questioning. Commissioner White, can you provide us uh, some information in regards to, excuse me, the Vincent Mason Coral Resort? The pool? Sure, I'll, 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 let, I'll let the disaster recovery specialist give you that information. Yes, Senator. Um, the construction has begun at the Vincent Mason Coral Resort. They're in the process now of excavating the pool. Some work is going on in the 
office and bathroom building presently as we speak. Thank you. Can you share with us the timeline by when you're expecting it to be completed? Uh, contractually, uh, the project is scheduled to be completed in April of this year. So However, everything, everything uh, seems the, like we're on target? Um, at this point, I think we may have a couple of delays due to manufacturing and shipping issues. We, 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 do, we do also, uh, Senator, estimate uh, some change orders to come in. Um, again, that's a facility that we're spending over $2 million on. There are some other things that are not hurricane damage. For example, the roadway to go into the pool. Uh, we are going to be seeking some funds to uh, address that, redoing the, the roadway. The guard boot, when you when you first enter the facility, uh, that was damaged by vandalism. It's not hurricane-related damages. Um, you know, I am going to be sending out, or the governor is going to be sending down uh, some information to reappropriate some funds that we have uh, in PFA to address the guard boot. There's some other beautification things that we want to do. The cabana, we want to, to repaint that, re, re, retain it, not retarnish, um, retain it, uh, just to make sure that when the facility is completed, it actually looked like some work was done with, with the facility. Uh, one of the issues that we have with some of our hurricane damages facilities is the work is being done and it's being completed, but because there's other work not associated with hurricane damage, it, it looks sometimes like nothing has been done. So. Uh, we are in communication with Public Works and the contractor. Uh, I, like I said, I could tell you, um, and I'm going to put it on the record now, um, I don't see it being done on April because of those change orders, and we know that some additional work needs to be done to make that facility look like it was work done there. So what are we talking about then, Commissioner White? What, what time frame? So, so, so I, I, I'm not going to commit myself to a time, and the reason is because those change orders haven't even been approved yet. So I, I can't give you a time, Senator. Um, I do know when the new change order is approved, there is a timeline placed uh, with the change order. So I, I, will, I will say at this time, when that happens, I have no problem reporting back to you as to what that, that time is. Now, the, comp the original scope of the pool will probably be finished by April, but the complete work um, is not going to be finished by, by April. Will the public have access when the pool section will be completed or won't have access until everything has been completed? I, I don't see there being access because, like I said, to get in the facility, you have to traverse the road. Um, if we're going to be repaving the road, um, the guard boot is right there to the entrance. It's still, it's going to be a construction site. Um, so no, there will not be access. Now, Senator, if you say you want it done April, we'll have the current work done as it is um, and give it back to the people. Um, but I, I've stated since I was the commissioner of this, this department, becoming a commissioner, that me and my staff believe that, you know, when we are not here, we want to turn over a better department to the next person that runs it. Um, so we're not going to settle for just giving them back to how it was before the hurricane. And then, uh, Commissioner, some of the things that you mentioned that you have had to add now to the change order, weren't those things visible at the beginning stage? Why now a change order and not include everything in the original contract? Is, was it a funding issue, oversight? Because we continue to so, have so, all these so change you, orders, it, you know, not only in various departments that delay more the process. Great, great question. So you can't start the original project, which is a FEMA project, with, a, with already change orders. Um, they, they submitted this change order pretty early in the project. Um, kudos to them. We've already received change orders from the company that's there now for the additional work. Uh, in reviewing the change order, I determined that some of the work that is in there, my staff can do. I have an awesome maintenance staff um, territory-wide. Uh, some of the change order had in things like, you know, painting the building, painting the cabana, which is not hurricane related, but my staff can get that done. I don't need that to be placed in a change order. 
So currently, I've already asked Mr. Abel, the disaster recovery special, to get with the director of maintenance, go over the proposed change order that, again, was already submitted, see what my staff can do, take that out. Um, I'm going to be reaching out to Mr. Gabriel from Public Works to address, to assist us um, with the re repaving of that 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 um, facility. Um, it's just more cost effective. What I'm going to pay the contractor to pave that that facility and what public work is going to charge me, you, you know, it's not going to be the same. So I, I, I want to be prudent. I want to be cost effective. But at the same time, like I said, I want to make sure I manage the project in an effective way. And I commend you for that. You do have to be good steward of the the people's funds. But we definitely need to ensure that we have that pool uh, open and available for the public no later than the summer. Um, our people have been waiting long enough, so I hope that uh, with all the change orders and with the work that your department and public work will assist and collaborate in, in doing, we should get it open by, by this summer. So I'm, I'm kind of holding you to that commitment. You, you said it, not me. Well, I'm putting it on your plate, you Commissioner. You said some of that. <laughs> and, I know, and I know you could get it done, because um, you surely have demonstrated it. Uh, but we're going to go now into a quick second round uh, with my colleagues of question. Uh, two minutes. Any pressing question you might have? Uh, Senator DeGraff, you're recognized for two minutes. Yes, sir. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. I was trying to find out the... Um, the uh, the cost change for uh, cost change order for number thirteen and number fourteen. What was what was the, the cost of those for for the um, Holy Joseph Stadium? Uh, Senator, I assume that's for me. Um, Derek Gabriel, Commissioner of the Department of Public Works. I'll defer to um Ms. Uh, Ms. Nicholas on that. Good afternoon, Senator Tawana Nicholas, DPW Chief Engineer. Change order 13 amount was $2.9 million. Change order 14 was the $4.1 million. Change order 14 triggered a supplemental contract. So, so that, that's, that, that's $16 million there. I mean, $6 million. And $18 million was mentioned, and $22.5 was mentioned for the total amount. So 22 point. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. The 22.9 plus the 4.1 brings us to a total of $27 million. One minute. Okay, so the 20, 27, and then there is still the $3 million still needed. So $30 million we're looking at. More or less, yes, Senator. Okay, so r right now, the 27, we're looking at any other changes presently that we've foreseen since since we start pouring concrete and we start moving is there anything else we're looking at because i know that three million dollars has to come from the government not as a part of this project correct so the 27 million dollars covers our existing contract drawings uh it's the may 2020 drawings the three million dollars that the governor mentioned during his state of the territory address is going to come from our a la carte menu, which are upgrades or add-ons to the project, as Commissioner Gabriel mentioned earlier, which would be items such as a, a generator, standby generator for the facility, solar lighting, additional landscaping. Um, we also have to consider items we need to put in for the Clomar. Those are the items we're still value engineering to determine um, which items would be cost effective for that $3 million. Okay, and finally, uh, Commissioner White, uh, the governor mentioned, uh, as you mentioned also, about the $1 million uh, for the launch of the health and, witness, uh, health and wellness campaign. Is that money available presently? And... Uh, what time frame are we looking for the kickoff of that? Yes, Senator, the, the funds is available. Uh, originally, uh, it was myself and the governor's idea that we wanted to subcontract somebody to run those programs. Again, uh, I have some of the best individuals uh, in the field of sports and recreation 
um, and I, I wouldn't call the individual name, but one of my senior staff members believe, on top of all the other things that they're doing now, that they will be capable of running that program. Um, so we, we, I, I need to have the conversation first and make sure everybody's on board um, before we make that decision. But if we decide that we can do it, I could see it rolling out uh, within a month or two. So would, would that million dollars uh, include any stipends that you may have to pay to any of your um, employees? Um, I don't think it would work that way. We are more looking to subcontract individuals, Zumba instructors, okay. uh, water, water health instructors, um, Calypso dance and, and, and whatnot. Um, we are just going to manage it, but we want to give it to community um, health um, people to run these programs on behalf of the, the department. We want to do something fun. Um, you know, we, we, we kind of want to get away, which it's still important, the, 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 the testing and the blood pressure and diabetes. We more want to do the physical fitness so we could address uh, some of the health issues of the people in the community. Okay, thank you very much. And, and keep Savan basketball court in mind for cover too, you know. Thank so, you. so, so, Senator, I do want to put on the record, and you, I, I heard you said Savan a couple of times. What people don't realize is Savan is not one of our facilities. I know, that's what uh, we're The saying. department right. just decided that, you know, we, we heard the outcry of the community. So I took it, well, not I, we took it upon ourselves to uh, assist Savan and get them some brand new basketball rims. Uh, I will tell you that I have some additional monies once our re resurface uh, contract is finished that I'm going to go back and address about five to six additional courts. Savan is one of them to get resurfaced and 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 thank you and repave. Yeah, well, I just wanted to make sure uh, that you mentioned that because that's why thank you so big, man. I really appreciate that highly. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Chair, for the time. Uh, thank you, Senator LeGraff. Senator James, you recognize for your two minutes. Thank you once again, Mr. Chair, for the time. Um, Commissioner Carver White. Um, like I said, I started off in my line of questioning first. I gave you the good, which you're doing a great job, and I gave you the bad. We are not here to be kumbaya by every minute. So I did say you're doing a great job, so don't take it for us now. All right. Uh, when it comes to the lights in the park, right, I know when in the 33rd legislature of the Virgin Islands, you had a great testimony. Anytime you come down here, I must admit, you always come ready like you to rewrite that thing a million times. But um, you mentioned that you have lights in the park and that you were working with some um, stakeholders and what have you. What is the status of the lights in the park? I know it's COVID-19. We're going to hear the excuse of the pandemic, but just give us some update with the lights in the park. Just, just to clarify, you mean having the lights turned on in our facilities? You mentioned that you purchased a bulk order of lights. Um, I can't, if I want, if I have a chance, I could go back and read the testimony, but it was a great testimony. You mentioned you have the lights, da 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 da, it's gonna take some time, and that was almost a year and a couple months ago. What's, what's the status of the lights? So, so some of the LED lightings is um, embedded in some of our FEMA projects. So, a lot of our baseball fields, we were fortunate uh, to get FEMA to approve the changeover from the high pressure sodium to the LED light. So once the contractor, once the contract is awarded to the contractor, they are going to be responsible uh, for addressing those lighting situations. Uh, early on, we kind of thought whether we should do the light separate, um, but the decision was made to, to have the contractor address those once they were doing work at the facility. Thank you. And you also mentioned in a press release, I think it was in the 33rd legislature of the Virgin Islands, where the governor received, I think, $2.1 million. Um, it was awarded to repave a lot of the tennis courts and the, the basketball courts. How is that coming along? Uh, it's going really well. Uh, it's a little slow. Um, as I stated earlier, it, it, it actually was $735,000, Senator, that we got from the Department of Interior. Currently, the contractor is on St. Croix. They are now at their fourth facility. Uh, the, the parks that was completed so far was uh, Emil Henderson down in the west. Uh, the second one was uh, Isaac Boynes uh, in Grove Place. The third one was Pedro Cruz. And currently today, they are at Reynolds Jackson 
which will be probably completed this week. I can tell you, following that, the next facility is going to be uh, Princess um, on the eastern of the island. And then I have asked them to then spend some time in the St. Thomas St. Jack district uh, addressing a couple of our courts. Hi. All the courts so far has been done in St. Croix. Well, I just want to let you know, if you drive on the Melvin Evans Highway and you look at the Lagrain, I mean, the one, the, the, the basketball court by Princess, they are both cousins. Pato's. So um, the one in Princess needs a lot of attention. And as you speak about Pato's, um, I have another question for the Department of Public Works, which is indulgence. It's about the Sire Farm Ball Park, Chairman Carrion. Um, my family lives, lives in Sire Farm. And I will tell you this much, is that this, is, this is an accident waiting to happen. When you're coming out of Sire Farm Ball Park, to make the right, like you're heading towards the Mokko. So you make the entrance to come out of Sire Farm Ball Park and you make the right. If you look to the left, there's a house, and there's a pato to the side of the road. Not in the middle of the road, the side of the road. It forces you to go on the right-hand side. And if you go over the hill, anytime you travel over there, you go over a hill. And usually people do speed over that hill. So the pato forces you to go in the right lane. And if a car is speeding over that hill, then it causes an accident. And we know that the Sire Farm Bar Park is a heavily utilized area. So I just want to put you on notice that that needs to be addressed. Thank you, Chairman Carrion, for the time. Thank you, Senator James. Senator Carla Joseph, you're recognized for your two minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner White, I want to go back to your testimony, and I really want to commend you on establishing your newest uh, baseball program, reviving baseball in inner cities or your RBI programs. I really want to commend you. I like to see action taking place and we bring in new innovative uh, programs to help build our athletes up and so that they could take off and fly and then earn a lot of money and hopefully come back to the Virgin Islands and donate their money as well as their time. Now, uh, when did you uh, begin this program? When did this program begin? I'll ask my district administrators to explain. Uh, Ms. Henry? Hi, good evening. Jamila Henry, St. Croix District Administrator of Sports and Recreation. Um, officially, we kicked off the actual activities in, um, I want to say, October, September, October. Um, the initial registration process done and everything like that actually started um, last year, July, August. Okay. Okay, that's good, because then my follow-up question would have been re relative to the scholarship uh, fund that you have to provide annual scholarship. So you haven't uh, provided any scholarship because this is a new program. And so the scholarships are geared towards young people who are graduating from high school or those going into uh, high school. Because I noted it said po uh, pr pursue secondary education. Is it post-secondary or secondary? So um, what the program is designed to do is um, not directly give out scholarships, but we're working to assist the student athletes with obtaining scholarships, those that are going on to higher education. So it'll be colleges, universities, so forth. Okay, thank you so much. Mr. Chairman, I reserve the You're rest welcome. of my time. Thank you. Thank you. Very generous of you, Senator Joseph. Senator Franklin Johnson, you're recognized for your two minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I would like to go to this change out of 14. And, and we just received a spreadsheet, and I, I, I need some help with it. I'm seeing press box. I'm seeing concession area. I'm seeing fixed seating. I'm seeing a lot of things in this change order that I really believe should have been in the park. So somebody help me out with these change orders. Change order for so Senator again, Derek Gabriel, Commissioner for the Department of Public Works. Change order 14 triggered what we call a supplemental contract. So if you want like the specifics, I can ask um Miss Nicholas to expound on it. But change order 14 is what triggered the, the, the supplemental contract in the amount of 4.1 million dollars. And, and, and some of that came out of um, the adjustments we needed to make for the Clomar. Miss yes, Nicholas. Sir. And I'm I'm seeing these items from the 
document that I received, and that's why I started listing things that I know should have been in the ballpark, which was the press box, concession area, uh, seating, ticket, boots, and gating control. So somebody help me. Are we saying that this stuff was taken out and then no, we had to do a change order to put it back in? So again, I'll ask um, Ms. Nicola to expound if she's on the call. Oh, my time just running without nobody speaking to me, Mr. Chair. So, yeah, I, I, I see her there, but I guess she's having technological or technology issues. Um, so I know some of these things, we, like I said, we were discussing. She would probably be the best person, though, to, um, to expound on them. All right. In, in this same document that I received, I saw where there's a breakdown from the 22.9. And then it, it says, um, based on what I'm looking here, the value of $20.4 million, and I ex understanding that that was all what they spend. And the value that's uncompleted is 2.4. So can somebody again so, help me uh, with this breakdown? Because we went from we went from 22.9 to 18. And now this document that I receive is showing me just about 20.4 million been spent in this project. If I'm sorry, correct. I, 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 I apologize, but I don't know what spreadsheet it is that you're referencing. So it's a little bit difficult I, I for me to follow you. This, and I received this, this came from the Department of Public Work. Can so you you're, see referencing, it? you're referencing the last pay estimate. That's what yeah. you said, spreadsheet. December you're referencing 30th. the last pay estimate. Yeah. Okay. Ms. Nicholas, I see Ms. Nicholas is back. Ms. Nicholas, do you mind um, expounding on the last change order? I'm sorry, my apologies. I went to the restroom. Can you repeat the question, please? I was looking at change order 14, and I saw a lot of... <laughs> A lot of items that I know personally belongs in a ballpark, press box, seating, and I'm trying to find out if these items was taken out the project and now that change order brings them back in. So I wanted to explain, somebody to explain to me, based on this document that came from Public Work December 30th, 2021, and I'll be specific with the page that I just saw here was page... Page number four, no, one of four, when it came to the change order. Change order 14. So change order 14, yes, are items to add back in to complete the construction of the of the drawing, to complete the scope of work for the drawing set for May 2020. So the change order 13, um, which was before my time, but change order 13 indicates scope of work for final drawings. There were revisions made. Um, this is design build. So some of that $2.9 million for change order 13 incorporated some engineering costs as well as scope of work changes. Some items in that two, for that 2.9 change order went to zero and the 4.1 brings it back to the cost to complete that scope of work item, which takes care of the balance of the scope of work items for the May 2020 drawing set. And can anybody be specific and tell me what this next $3 million is actually going to be used for? This a next, the governor asking for the next $3 million. So currently, as we restarted the project, um, I believe in previous testimony, there is a $3 million line item list. We've met with stakeholders. We've met with Sports Park. We've met with WTJX. We are value engineering that a la carte menu. Some items have been added due to the Clomar. Some other items have been added because stakeholders um, have, ident have identified additional upgrades that they would like to see happen at the sports complex. And we are currently um, fine tuning the scope. I'll actually be meeting with Commissioner White later this week or next week to further refine the scope so we could send it to GEC. They will then provide their um, updated costs and we will be presenting um, items that we feel would be uh, best um, best use of the three million dollars. Any, anybody have an idea of what some of these items are at this moment? Yes. Time? 
Yeah, it, the one I have, I, so I can give him a couple of them. So like we said, it's um, one of them specifically is to, um, is to change the lighting to solar. We're going to be doing, like Tawana said, some Colmar items, um, so site work. We are adding, we're adding a permanent bandstand behind the outfield um, state, behind, behind the outfield wall, adding some premium seats, so some VIP seats, some concession and sports equipment, and a standby generator. Those are some of the um, items. Thank you very much, Mr. Che. But I, I would wrap up with this and say, you know, what, what's, what's bothering me with this Pali Joseph Stadium? And, and I, I, I'm, I'm proud to be a part of the past administration. And I'm proud to be a part of that project that was presented that had all of these items already in it that would have gave us a state of art ballpark. And we go back and forth, delayed, to now come back and put him back in the same thing that we first said we needed. That would have gave us a park that could have brought in minor leaguers, could have brought in the professionals, and now we got to go back now to put them into doing. Thank you very much for the time, Mr. Chair. You so, are Mr. welcome, Chair, I, Senator uh, if I may just Johnson. Just... You need to clarify something, Commissioner Gabriel? Yeah, I just, if I'm not mistaken, and I mean, and, and to, to, to want us to, to Ms. Nicholas's point, well, some of this was before our time, I think that we've really owned it. But my understanding is, when the previous when when it previously went down to the Senate to request more money, we were given and I don't I don't have the figures in front of me, but we were given a some amount of money and we were told, hey, spend this, do what you can with this, and when you need the additional upgrades, come back and report to this body. So I think that it's that's been the consistent theme all along that we knew we were coming back for additional items. So Senator Johnson, I I I, I am forgive me, I don't know if you are part of the body, but that's my understanding, and I know a lot of that was done prior to my time here at the department. But that doesn't mean we're not owning it. And we are owning completing a park that can still um, that can still meet the needs of not only Fredrickson, but of the people of the Virgin Islands, and it could still be a hell of a sports attraction. And, um, I'm gonna allow you, Senator Joseph, quickly your point of inquiry. We must move along with today's uh, last block. Thank quickly. you. Thank you so much. Once it's, Ms. Once it's germane to. Of course it is. You Thank may. you so much, Mr. Chairman. Um, <coughs> Director, I'm sorry, Commissioner Gabriel, as well as your team member, does the increase in construction cost factor in uh, compared to when this project started to where it is and looking at some of the delays that were unplanned to the increasing cost? for uh, the overall project. Can you speak on that? I mean, I think that's a good point. Um, <clears throat> so when we started this project, construction costs were, were significantly less. I mean, right now we're watching construction costs grow on really on a monthly basis. Um, as Commissioner White stated earlier, sometimes we may put out a bid um, and maybe pull back for some reason or the other. And when we put it back out, we're seeing bids go up by 10, 15, in some cases, 20%. So I think that's a, that's a that's an excellent point. That construction costs have increased um, exponentially, especially on the island of St. Croix. Senator Francis, uh, you're recognized for your two minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I, I think it's in this whole discussion that we want to be fair in terms of the discussion. And in fact, when the former administration as well came with the, the plan, it certainly had an increase and spiral from $27 million up to about $40 million. So, um, you know, at the time, yes, there were tremendous work to be done and there were additional properties to be purchased and a lot more to go on. But at the same time, the costs also had increased to almost $40 million at the time. Uh, so when um, the administration, this current administration came before the Senate, the $3 million was in fact mentioned, the $8.2 million, we decided that we'll give 4.1 over one fiscal year and the following fiscal year we'll give the additional 4.1. I was very adamant um, as the president of the legislature at the time and as a senator to say we're not giving up no more $3 million for the, um, for the additional work to be done unless we started to see some level of progress. 
So we continue to see progress. We'll continue to monitor the progress that's being made so that we can make a determination at the appropriate time whether or not the $3 million will, in fact, um, be necessary to make sure that this project is completed to at least some level of, um, of satisfaction. Again, to make sure that we have a state-of-the-art stadium uh, for the people of, of um, St. Croix and for the town of Fredericksted. I wanted to ask you, um, Commissioner, in respect to the additional $3 million, were there any discussion in that, uh, whether or not um, the link fencing that was being proposed, whether that was adjusted to um, a wall fencing as well? Yes, that is correct, Senator. Okay. Right, so um, I, th I think that we're in, on, on all we gotta do is continue to monitor this project and make sure that we have, and I thank, I wanna thank the chair uh, for certainly calling this, this particular meeting and we're able to see um, what's being, and also hear from the stakeholders in terms of the progress that's being made there and we continue to forge forward to make sure that the progress continues. Uh, SPR, uh, Commissioner White, have there been any marketing? Um, or any discussion in respect to marketing of the stadium once it's completed? Time? No. Okay, and um, if I may wrap up, Mr. Chair, with just one follow-up to yes, that real yes, quick. Yes, yes, you may, sir. In respect to the management of the stadium, have there been any discussion whether or not it will be handled in-house or this will be privatized for uh, um, a management company to actually run the stadium? No, I, I think the consensus right now is that stadium will be turned over to the Department of Sports, Park, and Recreation. Um, but great point, Senator, because I do want to put it on the record that with the adoption of a $27 million stadium, the Department of Sports, Park, and Recreation is going to need to increase its budget. There's going to be utilities that has to be paid for. There's going to be staff that have to be placed at that facility, um, equipment. Um, so I just want to put it on the record early um, that for us to have a successful run of managing it, uh, we, we can't be set up to fail, that we are going to need some additional funding uh, to manage that facility. Very well. So do you have a funding or will you be submitting to the legislature um, your projection and what it will cost to, to be able to manage that facility? We'll certainly um, we, need we, it. I most definitely will be su submitting a uh, comprehensive plan of, of all that will probably be needed uh, for us to be successful in, in managing that facility. Very well. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> and again, um, you know, we stand in support of, of, of this measure. We want to make sure that we're building a state of the art and at least a satisfactory um, stadium. And we're exposed to that salt air. And we know corrosion and everything else is a costly venture to build these facilities. Um, you know, in our open, show, close to the shoreline area. So we have a work cut out for us, and it's, it's a costly venture. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for the time and the opportunity. Thank you, testifiers, for your responses. You're welcome, Senator Francis. Uh, Senator uh, James has a quick point of inquiry. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, for the time. My inquiry is about my previous line of question, and I just want to make sure which, which one of us um, is on point. But um, based on this press release dated February 3rd, 2021, it said that uh, Governor Brown received some money from the Department of Inter Interior, and is a project to repa repave and reline 42 courts at 21 facilities in the U.S. Virgin Islands which it says that we are going to receive $2.1 million in the capital improvement project grant awarded to the territory. But I know recently the commissioner said $700,000. So I want him to clarify, please, so we can make sure that we get it on the record. Commissioner? The, 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 the $2.1 million is the money that the governor received from the Department of Interior. As the governor of the Virgin Islands, he has the authority to designate where those funds go. The Department of Sports, Park, and Recreation did not receive the entire 2.1. As a matter of fact, I think VIPD received some funds from that. I don't know the exact number, Senator, but of the 2.1, we only received $735,000 for, for that resurfacing project. But you are correct. He did receive 2.1. Um, the 735, I could only speak to of what we received. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. At a later time, we need to look into that to make sure what's, hap what's happening with the remaining of the funds, because I was under the impression that the entire $2.1 million would go towards 
our basketball courts and tennis courts. Thank you. Good, good question. Uh, Senator Alma Francis Halliger, you're recognized for two minutes. Hi, good afternoon. I really want to spend my two minutes focusing on marketing, advertisement, and potential revenue generation to be able to maintain and sustain this $20 million project. Now, granted, we as a government, a lot of times it's easy for us to say increase the budget, but seeing that this project is online and there's going to be some completion date, since it's going to be under your jurisdiction, Commissioner White, have you seriously started looking at who's going to be using this facility, marketing it, potentially to be able to generate monies, um, whether you want to put up advertisement throughout the location to generate monies. What are some of the things that you're looking to do to potentially reduce the cost on the government in order to maintain and sustain this $27 million plus up to $40 million project? So, so great question, Senator. And, and it's, a, it's a conversation that we have had. Um, getting a state-of-the-art facility is now going to allow St. Croix to encourage uh, what is sporting events or sporting groups to come to the island. Of course, the backlog is always, where are they going to stay? So that's a different conversation that needs to be had. Um, but it, I will tell you this, that it's very easy, um, just from my experience, to get sporting promoters, sporting events, sporting groups to come to the territory. It's an easy sell. Um, so I don't foresee a problem as well as getting people to utilize the facility. Um, but I do think that there needs to be a more comprehensive plan as far as hotel stay, um, what is Airbnbs of where individuals are going to stay um, at the stadium. I could put up, uh, I, I could promote an event that is going to bring 2,000 people to the territory or to the island of St. Croix. But we all know that bringing that amount of people, they're going to have to have somewhere to sleep and stay. Um, so until we have that discussion, um, talking about sports tourism and using the facility for other things, uh, I think we need to have a more overall conversation with that, Senator. Definitely. And I, I look forward to having those types of conversations and you guys bringing a marketing plan and a potential revenue generating plan before us so we could fully understand the magnitude as to how we could utilize not only for local purposes, but also individuals wanting to come into the territory to make full use of this facility. So thank you so much for that answer. Time. I do want to add that the department do have uh, a sports tourism fund that is under the Department of Tourism. So we will be tapping into that uh, to promote the use of, of the new stadium once it's turned over to us. Excellent. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Chair, for the time. Thank you, Senator Francis Heiliger. Uh, good question. And this is the time for us to ensure that we have everything that we need for that park. So it's scheduled to be completed 2023. That's... Within a year, basically, that's next year. So we need to make sure, Commissioner, that you have the budget in place, to have the resources that you need for the maintenance and also the marketing component to it. So all of that should be coming down for um, our budget season hearing uh, this summer. Uh, Commissioner, Commissioner, Senator Payne, a senior, you're recognized for two minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, is Mr. Uh, Wessel, um, still online or is he logged out? Yes, Senator, I'm still online. Yes, good, Mr. Wessel. How many years has this project been in the works, uh, the Pauli Joseph Stadium? The contract was originally signed under Governor DeYoung's administration in 2014. Okay, and um, what, was that, what, was that, what exactly were the nature of the delays incurred that has prolonged the work on the stadium and the construction of the stadium? Most of the delays occurred under Governor Mapp's administration. Uh, when Governor Mapp was with the Public Finance Authority in 2005, he had hosted a series of charrettes in Frederickstead that resulted in a stadium design that was uh, was quite spectacular, actually. And the immediate action that he took regarding the stadium after he became governor was to revise the contract and resign the revise the design uh, along the lines of uh, what senator francis just spoke of and it, it would actually was closer to 45 million uh dollars that the that governor maps design 
uh, revised it to. That that took almost all of Governor Mapp's administration by the time the contract was changed, the design was changed. Uh, someone referenced the, uh, I think, uh, Tawana referenced the additional uh, um, geotechnical reports that had to be done. So the main delays in this project were in relocating the stadium from its additional footprint, which was where the uh, original contract contemplated it would be built, leaving the concrete outfield wall in place, to a new location based on the recommendations of the experts in the uh, in the field of ballpark design. So. That's why it, that's the short version of why it took so long. Yeah, and do you anticipate any more delays moving forward? <clears throat> only if only if there are design changes that take extra time. And right now, there are none of those under discussion, uh, with the possible exception uh, exception of what uh, Commissioner Gabriel was talking about. The ge uh, generator lead time, if that is elected as part of the a la carte menu, can be real long right now, depending on what the specifics of the generator are. Everything else should be, as far as we know right now, everything else should be okay. Time. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your response. Uh, Commissioner White, uh, Mr. Chair, can I ask Commissioner White one question? You, you can wrap it up, sir. Okay, yes, uh, Commissioner White, two, uh, President one, two quick. Uh, when will the scoreboards and fencing be in place for all the territory sports? And what's the status on the park, the National Park and St. John? And what's the agreement with National Park and Sports and Parks relative to that park? Thank you, repeat, repeat the first question, Senator. I was, I was asking uh, about the scoreboards and fencing for all of the parks in the territory. Is, is that on your uh, menu? To have yes, so, scoreboards and fencing. So the majority of the parks that, that are the baseball court, baseball, baseball parks that we have um, prior to the hurricane all had scoreboards. Uh, we know that the majority of them lost scoreboards uh, to the hurricane. Uh, fortunately, those are items that were granted within the funding that we are getting. So again, um, the contractor that is awarded the specific uh, contract at any one of the parks they will be responsible for purchasing and replacing the scoreboard at, at that facility. They have the specs, um, the size of what kind of scoreboard uh, was there before, what the department is asking for. So the contractor will be responsible for that. I, I want to explain that a lot because a lot of times we would get calls and say, well, okay, if you're not fixing the facility now, at least pull up the scoreboard. And the reason we can't do that, Senator, is because the scoreboard is part of the actual project. Um, with construction work, there's also items that are in the construction scoreboards, um, speaker system, if we had a speaker system at the facility. Uh, so a lot of the time, we just have to wait till the contractor is awarded a contract, and they are responsible for purchasing it and, and replacing it at the uh, facility. Uh, uh, addressing your second question, we've had a great relationship with the National Park over the years, Mr. Hill has been the one kind of spearheading the relationship uh, <coughs> between DSPR and, and the National Park. Um, <coughs> sorry. They are close to completing the National Park. Um, the department is willing and able to do the transfer. We have to do a sign MOU with them, uh, giving us permission to manage uh, that facility. Uh, but we are currently uh, going to be having that conversation between myself, property and procurement, and the National Park. But that is the plan. Once that park is completed, it will be managed and run by the Department of Sports, Park, and Recreation. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your response. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair, for the time. You're welcome, uh, Senator Payne. Senator Whitaker, you're recognized for your two minutes. Thank you, Chairman. I want to dive in um, in questioning both Commissioners White and Gabriel. Um, we have um, found even, of course, even with um, construction projects, right, in the Virgin Islands, of late especially. Historically, we have some very old buildings that go back into like 40, many years ago, where they contractors apparently were building um, very strong buildings that even with still hurricanes. Um, there has been a lot of issues surrounding um, contractual work um, and maintenance of buildings. Um, uh, can either of you really speak to insuring and, and what insurances you're going to be making in terms of the warranties for the parts? I'm talking about all the building and all the parks. 
and how um, and how can you hold these contractors accountable? Because even one of the contractors, as I d dive into my research, um, is responsible for some of the temporary um, schools uh, facilities, is at least one for Pedro Cruz. So can you, we dive into ensuring that the contractors can just leave the island and and, and leave us, you know, um, with um, the buildings that are falling apart once they leave? So uh, um, you want me to go first, Commissioner White, just from a programmatic perspective, and then you can speak to your department. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so overall, Senator, one of the things that we've been doing is paying a tremendous amount of attention in the design programming process to make sure that we're having buildings that are um, a lot easier to maintain. Um, I think that's first and foremost. Um, we're making our buildings more resilient. We're making them more energy efficient, um, et cetera. I think um, one of the other things that we've been doing is making sure that <clears throat> moving forward, we're doing commissioning where we're testing and actually going through all of the specialized equipment, not only in the parks, but in the buildings. Um, and we're making sure that we're having checklists done with the contractors and going through them so that we make sure all these systems are working prior to them turning over the building and us making final payments. I think that's really critical because if you once you hold payments, you hold people responsible. Time. Commissioner White. So on the department part, and I let Assistant Commissioner Roberts uh, speak because he was the one to spearhead this. I, I think one of the biggest issues when it came to our facilities um, was that there was no preventative uh, measures being taken. I think you know a, a facility would be addressed only when there was an issue, something was falling apart and whatnot. Um, and he has uh, took the wheel and kind of spearheaded. Um, a new preventative system that we are going to be putting in place. So I, I'll ask him to, to to talk about that. So what what we are presently doing, uh, Senator, is uh, implementing a software program by the name of uh, Upkeep, which is basically tracking all the assets at our facilities, uh, keeping track of where we, we are doing the most maintenance, if we're spending a lot of money on sinks or toilets, <clears throat> and so forth. So. It kind of gave us a better uh, idea of where we're spending money, where we could cut costs, um, and just kind of better track our inventory. So it, it helps us yeah. in the long run with just just kind of managing the facilities. Yeah, that's that's excellent. And I just see this, and that's what I like to hear. We're using technology to to our benefit because, as as you know, we we've had. Senator Whitaker got frozen. Oh, Thank Can you. you me? Yeah, you got, you got frozen there for a minute. Uh, you you, you yeah, can, you can conclude. I'll let my time run out. <laughs> yes, yes. yes, I'll let conclude. Thank you, Chairman. Now, just saying thank you, thank you both commissioners for your um, for your statements, and let's just continue to, to hold them to accountable. And and if we find that a contractor is not um, didn't bill well. Let's um you know use our um you know our, our legal team to um, use your legal team to address those issues. We don't want to end up um you know a situation where we're holding onto something and then we 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 end up in a situation we we know those situations. So I just hope I wish the best for the projects and um just to hold the contractors accountable. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Senator Whitaker. Uh, Commissioner White. Uh, you mentioned the A and E designs have been complete for a state profit community center. What's the next step, and what's the timeline for that? They, they, they're not finished, Senator. If that's what I said, I misspoke. Uh, I said the concept, conceptual design is finished, but the A and E service is not completed. Got you a timeline frame then. Um, I'll ask Mr. Abel to speak on that. I think currently that they are about 30 or 40 percent uh, completed on the A and E uh, right now. I think that's the last report that I got. It was about 30 to 40 percent. Mr. Abel? Yes, that's correct. Yes, Commissioner, that's correct. They have finished the design conceptual drawings. Upon our our approval, then they'll be working on the finalized drawings. Do we have a timeline for completion? Are they indicated? They indicated it will take approximately 60 days to complete. 60 days to complete. And then it goes out to bid, Commissioner? That is correct. Once it's approved by DP, DPW. All right. Thank you. Uh, Senator Gittins, you're recognized for your two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I might need a little, little more than two minutes, so I'll beg from the onset. 
But, you know, I, I heard the vice president talking about the uh, Polly Joseph stadiums. But I must say, before I go to what I really want to say, that two administrations back, uh, this is under the De Young administration, as a freshman senator, when I told them to put the brakes on this thing, because what we get in uh, apparently is a pig in a basket, everybody wanted to take my head off. There was this one elderly gentleman, I still have respect for him, rest his soul, but he used to ride me on the airwaves every day, talking about this senator from Frederickstead not uh, trying to hold up the Pali Joseph Stadium. Now, you see where we are still today, three administrations later. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the, I wanted to uh, just show uh, so that colleagues can see, because some have been asking me, about the site down in Frederickstead, and uh, I'm still holding the commissioner that we're going to do this walk through. But I think uh, media Absolutely. have uh, some of the pictures, and I, I would like to show it. And as the, the pictures are being shown, I, I, I must say that these uh, benches and table, like I said, um, really pose a hazard, a danger to our community, and needs to be uh, removed post haste. These uh, concrete benches and tables, as you go down and you traverse the area, you're seeing even little children playing on these things. And we are already uh, saying that we don't have the uh, sufficient ambulance service, we don't have good health care, et cetera. When we see these hazards, we need, uh, we need to take care of it. I'm not an engineer, but if you could move to the... Um, to the video, because this even includes this, the sidewalk. And see some of those, I think that's what you call the rebars. I know a thing about building. But um, these um, rebars coming out of these concrete uh, pillars, I don't think that we, we, we need an engineer to tell us uh, what we need to do to condemn that. I'm not an engineer, like I said, but I don't believe that uh, engineering is necessary for us to make the decision to to remove at least the, uh, these hazards. Uh, this is a definite liability to the government, and police tape, caution tape, won't be able to help us. So um, I'm really asking that we uh, address this sooner rather than later, because it's something waiting to happen, and like the uh, Vice President said, post haste. Time. Right, so, uh, Commissioner, I'm asking that uh, when you come that we go down there. Hopefully the um, Public Works Commissioner uh, can be there as well so that we don't have a, a back and forth because I, I don't want to play a ping pong. I just want to be able to see this done and uh, so that you could continue doing the good work that your agency is doing. I, I really must say that your agency is, is doing a, a, a lot of good work, and that's why I asked about the... Uh, public relations person. So all the other um, areas that we're not hearing about, we need to be able to hear what the progress are so that we can know that um, something is actually going on. Uh, thank you, Mr. Um, Chair, uh, for the latitude. Thank you, um, Senator Gittins. And clearly your statement has been made, and I'm sure the commissioner, both commissioners will address the matter. Uh, Commissioner, uh, with regards to um, your critical hires, I know that I, along with my colleagues, fought for you um, to receive additional funds in order for you to get the critical hires that you need. What's, what's the status with that? I was happy to hear you um, selected someone as your uh, PIO for the Department of Sports, Park, and Rec. Uh, what's the status with the other positions that you still have vacant? Specifically, I'm, I also, would ask Ms. I'm also interested in the Marine Coordinator position. What's the status with that also? So I, I would ask Ms. Pell, my HR manager, to, to talk about it. Good afternoon, Relina Pell, um, HR manager. Um, we were successful in hiring most of the critical positions. Um, the Marine Coordinator is still out um, pending. We are having some difficulty getting qualified people that actually could deal with um, 
qualify for the position. But almost all of the critical other positions, like our groundskeepers, our extra custodians, general maintenance workers, were all hired. I'm glad to hear that you're moving on that. Um, have you, Commissioner, considered maybe uh, internally uh, promotion if, if you have anyone for that position? So, so all our positions um, are available for the current staff that is there um, to apply for. Um, I don't know, Ms. Pell would have to tell you if anyone internally applied for it and did not qualify, but we do encourage our staff um, that is already working with us to, to uh, apply for any positions that are out for them. Um, Relina um, Pell, HR manager. Yes, um, we usually post all of our positions to all our facilities. Um, I also send out um, emails to the employees, but no one internally was interested in the position. All right, Commissioner, also you wanted to bring some parity between titles and positions, and I believe maybe even salary it's in some cases between both districts. Where are you with that? Ms. Pell? Ms. Pell, um, HR manager, Sports, Facts and Recreation. Um, we started the process already so far. Um, I promoted two employees, and next week um, we are continuing the interviews with the others for the St. Thomas, St. John district. But on St. Croix, we are, we are finished on the district of St. Croix. So that means that we are, um, we have changed the titles and so forth, like what we said, Commissioner? Correct. Okay. Correct. Okay. Uh, with regards to DC, can I get her ballpark quickly? So I understand there was a change of order for to replace the roof of the stadium. Can you please expound a little bit with regards to that? To change the roof? Yeah, the, the roof of the stadium, DC, can I get her? Complex, I should say. He's speaking about the uh, multi-purpose building, um, Commissioner. Okay. That's, yeah. So, so yes, we did get some hazard mitigation funds for the wind retro retrofit. Um, that is going to get a complete uh, roof rebuild for that facility. Uh, as I stated in earlier in my testimony, we was going, we was moving along the grounds of we're going to be able to use that facility as a safe room, which means we would have been able to house individuals there before a storm during a storm and after a storm, uh, after further consideration, it was deemed not eligible being in a floodplain, so it was then deemed uh, only available for a shelter. Okay. Uh, which is post-storm. Go ahead, I'm sorry. No, which, which is post-storm, so we'll only be able to use it post-storm, or post-disaster, sorry. Great, uh, Commissioner Gabriel, uh, with regards to the permits, I understand that you're in the process of, well, let me rephrase that. Permits were submitted to DPNR for building, plumbing, and electrical for uh, the stadium? Yes. Holly Joseph Stadium. What's the status and what's the timeline yes. for, for that? So I would defer, but I mean, I think, I believe we've gotten all of the permits except for the electrical. Tawana, please correct me if I'm wrong, because I know you had meetings up to today. That is, you're absolutely correct, Commissioner. Yeah. So which one you're missing? Again, I'm sorry, I apologize. Ele electrical. Mm -hmm. Electrical. And then uh, according to your testimony, these permits were submitted on December 15, 2021. Why were they submitted so late? I mean, under my observation, but I'm not sure. Maybe you could clarify. Um, were you waiting for the female approval? Why was, mm -hmm. was they were just submitted? Yeah, yeah correct. We're waiting not only for the female approval, but also, there, like we said, there had to be some, there were some slight changes, modifications that we had to make once a Comar was approved. So that's why, that's why you had that late submission, if you will. So there were some permits that were submitted prior and these were some changes that were added or no permits would submit, were submitted at all? This is the first time that permits were submitted to the EPNR for the project. I, it's, so I'm sorry, um, Ms. Nicholas, are you aware of that or do we, are you aware of any permits were submitted prior to December 15th? I'm not aware. Yeah, I would have to defer to Mr. Wessel. 
on that one. Mr. John? Good afternoon, Senator. Uh, if This is John Wessel from GEC, if I may. The, <clears throat> the permits were submitted based on the design that was approved for the foundation under the under Governor Mapps administration, and work was proceeding on that. When the when Governor Bryan's administration came in, as Commissioner Gabriel just commented, there were changes made to the structure and the designs to to meet the new budget number that Governor Bryan wanted, as opposed to the 45 million plus uh, that Governor Mapp wanted. So the decision was made still under Governor Mapp's administration to proceed with the uh, foundation work because regardless of what the changes were, the foundation was going to be sufficient for a, a reduced budget scope of work. So that work was going one, once, and then when the FEMA people, excuse me, said all work needed to stop, the permits were all put on hold depending whatever those changes were. And that's why shortly after those changes were approved last fall, uh, the final revisions were made and submitted to the Department of Planning and Natural Resources. Thank you for clarifying that, Mr. Um, Wessel. Uh, are we expecting any other change order? Or is there a change order number 15 that will be submitted or 16? So, Senator Carrion, right now, I mean, like we said, um, we know that we will have to come back for an additional at approximately an additional $3 million. Um, so that's going to be a change order. Other than that, right now, um, we feel good with the current scope of work. All right, uh, I think we've had a very long day and um, most of the questions, of all the questions that my colleagues have made have been answered, maybe some not to their satisfaction. I think we've exhausted uh, today's day. It's been a long day. I want to, um, before closing off, make sure if there isn't anything that is burning that one of my colleagues wants to ask. Senator Francis. Thank you very much. Uh, Commissioner White, in respect to getting some of our young men out of their, their homes and into some of these community centers, have there been any contemplation or uh, discussion in regards to um, uh, whether or not you'll have video games or anything that like of the sort competition again um, at, at the community centers that would uh, allow them to be, be a little bit more uh, socialized a little bit more um, rather than just being at home playing game? Yes, they'll still be playing games, but at least you know they'll be a little bit more social in doing it. Any thoughts about? having video games or the like, similar things at the community centers? So I, I, I hope that the PIO is listening to this hearing. Actually, he should be listening to this hearing because he, he has his work cut out for him. And I say that because, Senator, we have already done that, that type of stuff. Did the department purchase uh, several PlayStation uh, equipment and some big screen TVs? And we had a territorial... Uh, a territorial PS4 basketball, I think, baseball tournament where it was held at the different facilities. Um, I know it was done at um, Reynolds Jackson, WIM. I'll ask Ms. Henry to, exp to, to talk about it a little more, but we've already done stuff like that uh, in this department, Senator. Ms. Henry? Good evening, Jamila Henry St. Croix, District Administrator, Sports and Recreation. Um, yes, we did conduct a video game challenge. Um, I can't remember the exact date, um, but we did host it in Renhold Jackson Center in Fredericksted. Um, we didn't have a large um, turnout for the competition, um, but it is something we could look at doing again. Very well, thank you. Um, again, I guess with proper marketing and getting that information out, again, yeah. you have a lot of top secrets happening at the, um, yeah, I suppose, Park and Recreation. Yeah, I, I, I agree, Senator. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I, I think for whatever reason, it seems like the ball has been dropped with getting a lot of our programs and information out. I, I can tell you my staff does a great job going on the radio station. They, they You hear our commercials every day. I hear them. Um, I'm a little biased, but I, I hear our commercials on the radio Um our Facebook page has now over, I mean, there's 
the amount of views that I see on it, so people are seeing, are going to our page. Uh, we're on the radio stations, we're in the newspapers, uh, we have our, our, our website. But for whatever reason, and, and I continue to scratch my head, um, people are not hearing or seeing the programs that this department is doing. So I, I am going to hold the new PIO um, to task. He has a lot of work to do to figure out, you know, what it is that we're missing. But, you know, sometimes when I hear individuals say the department is not doing anything or we don't have programs, you know, it, it, I, I just don't see how because we are doing so much, but it's just not getting out to the people in the territory. So we need to do a better job of that. Um, and, and I know with the addition of the new PIO, uh, he's going to figure some new things out. Very well, thank you. Just talk to um, Commissioner Gabriel. He's all over the place. Instagram, Twitter, um, you know, Facebook. Every way you turn, a DPW is all over in your face. So um, maybe you could team up with him yeah. so, and, and, and get that done. So and we have all of those things. Uh, he just created a Twitter. He just created a, a, a Instagram. Um, I can tell you before it was myself, um, Assistant Commissioner Hansen. Um, District Administrator Henry, we were the one that was re responsible uh, for, for managing our Facebook page. Uh, we have a lot of work to do. So he is going to be dedicated and focused to only that, promoting the department. So hopefully you'll see a change in, in uh, how visualized this department is in the community. Yeah, you do. Okay, Senator, Senator Gidgens. Senator Giddens, you're recognized quickly. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, I've been, as you know, in uh, trying to encourage uh, the agency heads to take advantage of the U.S. Department of Interior uh, grants. And I'm sure that uh, the Department of Sports, Parks, and Recreation have, have applied for U.S. DOI grants. Can you tell us the status? Uh, how much you get and what's the status of the grant? Um, so we had a, a TAP grant, which is a technical assistant grant. Uh, I think that was only for about $10,000. That is going to assist us with our new T Corp that we're trying to get out. Uh, we had a MAP grant uh, that assisted us. I think gave us uh, our garbage truck was, I think, 115000 and we got half of that. Uh, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but that has awarded us to, to get a brand new garbage truck that is on sync right now that the department is using. I will say, Senator, that, um, you know, being a small department, um, we have one financial person, which is is, is Ms. Peters. I will tell you that we just recently, and I think we got it back yesterday, uh, PRF for an additional fiscal person. That individual is going to be responsible for handling our federal grants, which is going to allow us now to now go, go forward aggressively to get some more funds that are out there. there there's a lot of money out there. Uh, we just didn't have the capability of managing and handling it. Uh, it makes no sense to go out for those awards if we couldn't manage it. But just yesterday, we asked for, for some additional help. It was approved, so look forward for that in the near future. Great. Let's hire people to help manage these funds. Like you said, there's a lot of monies out there, and we need a lot of help. So we need to do this. Um, you, 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 you've taken advantage of the, um, I think it was some $1.7 million from the uh, national, um, I think it's a National Park Service um, annual grant. Are you aware of that? I am not. Okay. But um, I'll, I'll, when, when you get to St. Croix, so we could do that walkthrough, uh, we will talk so that I could put you in line uh, with the right folks at the U.S. Department of Interior so that we can take advantage of these monies. All we got to do is hire people to manage these funds. Thank you, Senator Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator so Gittins. Just, just to let you know, Senator, me and Commissioner Gabriel have already uh, communicated, and we will be there, uh, God's willing, next week. Uh, to do that walkthrough with you. Um, I would also so say that we are now three for three um, with the federal grants that we have gone gone out for. Um, Ms. Ms. Henry have been the one that applied for some of those grants. Um, so we do a lot of stuff internally. Fortunately, she had uh, some, 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 some grant writing expertise. Uh, she came from, 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 from that, that area, so she was able to assist us, and we was three for three, actually, I think three for four, 
in our grant writing. But hiring a new fiscal person to just deal with federal grants is going to be a big booster for us because, like I said, we can now aggressively um, go after some more funding. So I know you have to get that TCORP grant uh, information yeah. done, that process done. Correct. Please, let's uh, Correct. get that process completed so that we can take advantage of these monies. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Welcome, Senator Giddens. Senator Joseph, you recognize. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner Gabriel, I wanted to uh, really, really commend you and your staff, really, about you know sending out a lot of press releases and you're on target. But I won't uh, segue into anything that is not germane to today's agenda. So I wanted to ask, Commissioner White, a really prevalent question relative to the St. Thomas, St. John district. How are we looking with Oppenheimer Beach in St. John? I know that work was being done. I didn't see anything in your reports. Oppenheimer, tell us what we're doing with that beach. That's a very good beach, very good facility. So if you could just bring us up to speed. I know it's late in the day. So, so let me give you some background information on, on Oppenheimer Beach. And, so um, I'm glad you brought that up. And, and uh, Commissioner, the department had some $200,000 in PFA funds that we had intended to use uh, to add to the construction for that facility. Uh, the 33rd legislature uh, took that $200,000 from us and transferred it to uh, POW. Now, PAL is a great program, I, I, and, and you know what, I, I, don't, I don't even, I'm not even mad that the money was transferred because I know what that program does for our youth in the territory. I, I was part of PAL program. Uh, but what it did is it, it, it made me have to now go and look for additional funds for that facility, but uh, we will find it. Uh, like I stated earlier, I think you missed that, uh, Derek, Commissioner Gabriel and, and uh, sent up his engineer to St. John last week. They met with uh, Deputy Director Mr. Hill, went over the scope. Uh, so we should be putting that out for solicitation. Uh, Commissioner Gabriel, next month? Yeah, I think so. Next month, we're pretty confident with that. Okay, thank you so much on that update. And uh, Commissioner Gabriel, I'm hoping that when you put the scope together and you're looking for funding, no, I will be lobbying strongly for us to get some funding for Oppenheimer Beach. I have some really good memories of camping over there. So thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, for the leeway. You're welcome, Senator Joseph. Uh, and just uh, to be able to clarify, Senator Gittins, when he spoke about the TCORP grant process, he's speaking about a territorial comprehensive outdoor recreation plan. And we've had some conversations in regard to that, and I know Commissioner White is working. On, on getting that done and moving in that direction. I want to thank you, Commissioner White, and I want to also thank uh, Commissioner uh, Gabriel and Mr. John. And um, I also want to thank uh, both of your staff and um, leadership team for the work that they're doing. Thank you for the time uh, to be here with us this afternoon and testify and provide an update on the parks and all the recreation activities and, and the side for um, DSPR and um, Commissioner Gabriel for sharing an update on what's happening with Polly Joseph Stadium in Frederickstead. Um, I would give you both a 30 seconds to close. Some closing remarks. Well, I, I'm gonna need more than 30. Um, just some things I wanna put on the record. You know, uh, I, I just wanna say this really early because I foresee us being back here before this body um, once this stadium is completed. Uh, we're talking about a $29 million facility. Uh, when you look at the percentage for, for maintenance, we're talking about a uh, million dollars per year just to give to the department for us to maintain that facility properly. Uh, so I just want the, the legislature to, to, to be aware of that. Um, we have not promoted uh, sports tourism with the Polly Joseph Stadium, but I will say that uh, my staff have been promoting the territory uh, with sports tourism and, and getting individuals to come to the territory. In 2019, both my assistant commissioners, Assistant Commissioner Hansen and Assistant Commissioner Roberts, attending the team's conference in California, 
which is one of the biggest sporting conferences that have all the different sporting organizers, promoters um, attend this one conference. And I could tell you that the Virgin Islands is an easy sell. Um, I have no doubt that we'll be able to bring uh, events to the territory uh, with the, 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 the fact that we have a new state-of-the-art stadium. Uh, it, it, it makes it more lucrative. I, I will caution again, and I want to be clear with this, uh, being a former uh, 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 collegiate athlete, there is a level or a specific quality of, of, of traveling uh, expertise or, or, or amenities that, that teams look for when they travel, certain things that they act for. They need rooms with double beds, uh, just certain things that college coaches uh, will be asking for. They send people to, to scout and look at these hotels and look at these rooms. Um, not put no bad mouth on, on, on the hotels, but we are going to have to figure out if we seriously want to have sports tourism in the territory, we want to bring these teams. We know that we could be, bring them, but we have to figure out where we're going to put uh, these individuals when they come to the territory. A college coach is not going to want to bring a team and put them up in Frederick State Hotel. Um, and I'm not talking bad about the hotel. I'm just saying the level and the quality that they expect when they put teams, um, they're just not going to do it. So that's another conversation that we need to have when we talk about promoting the stadium uh, and, and bringing individuals. Inter, inter Island, we, we're going to up our game and that. We'll have more Inter Island with our children, St. Thomas, St. John, St. St. Croix. Um, but bringing, you know, you know, college coaches or professional teams, um, we are going to have to step our game up with, with the hotels. We brought DC United to the territory. We had some issues with them and, and Bermuda with, with as far as the hotels. But, but that is something that I know for a fact um, when dealing with sporting promoters, that is going to be um, top of, the, top of the, the conversation. Other than that, um, obviously, always, I, I want to thank my super, super team um, for all the work that they do. Uh, I try to remind people all the time when they say, you know, I'm doing a good job, that th this is not a one-man show. Uh, they do a lot of the heavy lifting. They love what they do. They're very creative, very innovative. And, and I, I just love working with them and look forward to us, you know, making this department better and, and, and just creating more opportunities for our children. And seniors, don't, don't forget the seniors also. Commissioner Gabriel. Yeah, um, thank you very much again, Senator Carrion, for this hearing. Um, I do want to just publicly commend not only Commissioner White, but like he said, his staff. Um, Commissioner White and I talk several times a week about all of his projects. I mean, he has a tremendous amount of projects going on right now, and his engagement and involvement is really, um, it's really a breath of fresh air. So I just want to commend him publicly. Um, <clears throat> I also want to go back, Senator Carrion, just to something that was said earlier, just to clarify it. I think one of the things that you've seen is since um, since last year, we brought on Miss Tawana Albany Nicholas, and she has really been tremendous. Um, since she's come on board, not only has she been really spearheading a lot of our um, disaster recovery projects, but she's taken on this project as well. Um, and she is the daily project manager. She does a phenomenal job, not only meeting with the stakeholders, but also the contractor and um, keeping everything on course. So I don't want to leave it publicly just because we didn't have a percentage complete that we're not actively and thoroughly managing this project. Um, we are, we're there on a daily basis. Tawana herself is there for every concrete pour. Um, it's over 400 pilings and several revisions to the design drawings that were done. So it's a little bit difficult right now to pin down that percentage complete, but I will tell you we are moving um, expeditiously forward to complete this for the people of Frederickstead particularly. Um, and, the, and last, just like Commissioner White said, I, I want to just thank my staff. Um, I can't thank them enough. They are phenomenal people. Every day we wake up and we know that while um, the job is sometimes um, difficult and you don't have a lot of resources to do it, we know that every day we're working for our neighbors, our friends, our family, and um, we're making our Virgin Islands a better place. Thank you, Senator Carrion. Thank you to all the senators. Um, I appreciate the meaningful discussion. And yes, we do have the best communications team in government. Appreciate you. Mr. John Whistle.
Thank you, Senator, for the opportunity. And I would like to commend both the sports parks and recreation team and the public works team uh, with a special kudos to Tawana Nicholas. I have just recently met her for the first time and I concur with uh, Commissioner Gabriel's uh, take on her capabilities and greatly appreciate it. And as a special thanks to uh, Senator Joseph, please do always remember that GEC's motto is building the Virgin Islands with Virgin Islanders. Thank you. I want to thank all three of you for your, your time this afternoon. And I want to thank you for your testimony. I recognize the work that uh, both of you uh, commissioners and your team are doing for the territory. Uh, I know there are many challenges, and I know there's always room for improvement and growth, and I thank you for being open uh, to constructive criticism in order to expand and grow what you're doing. Um, the people of Virgin Islands are expecting great things from the department, and they want to see things that are tangible. They want to see results. Um, they want to see action. So I know you guys can deliver. That's why you both have been appointed in that position. And I continue to look forward uh, seeing the great things that both departments will continue to deliver to the people of this territory. So I want to thank you both for that and look forward to collaborating and working along with uh, both of you, both departments. You, you all may be dismissed uh, this afternoon, evening now, and thank you once again. And as we close, Thank you. today has been a long day. We had some technical difficulties in the beginning. I want to thank uh, my staff uh, for sticking on, but especially also the legislature, the media team, and everyone, uh, my colleagues, those that are members and non-members of this committee. I want to also thank VIA for assisting us with some of the issues we're having today. So uh, thanks to everyone for their support. And as we continue to improve and uh, grow in the territory, let's continue to get our students out in a safe manner. Uh, let's continue to provide programs and activities that would assist them um, in being successful in the areas of uh, athletics. And also, let's continue to grow as a community. Um, beautification is key, and I want to um, thank everyone for the support that they've been providing, and thank you all. Uh, the Committee on Sports, Park, and Youth and Recreation is hereby adjourned. <laughs>